Ooh, today's podcast is a doozy. We have the Egyptian Drake, the king of short form content, one of my best friends, one of the most incredible human beings and a guy that I learn from every single day. And he blessed us with his genius on today's podcast. We talk about the number one thing you're most likely doing in your videos that make it an automatic loss, how you dive into earning the right to exchange pleasantries and what is required to get the attention of your viewer. Now, let me just give some context for the guy on this podcast. I challenged him on a reel of mine and we had like 2.6 thousand views and he's like, it can be better. And I was like, I don't see how he took it. He edited it. He didn't get any new footage. He actually just chopped out about seven seconds and changed the order, reposted it, same caption on my account. And then I got like 44,000 views. And then I decided to just shut up and listen. And this is the guy on today's podcast. And so he shared about the tease gap and how you can create positive tension in your videos that keep them watching. And then we just dive in and decipher the perfect video formula, including all all the key components required to set your short form content to gain traction and reach. Mo is a master of communication. He has degrees in psychology and communication. He is one of the most intelligent, communicated, fluent relationship people I've ever met. And when he applies it to short form content, it's untouchable. And I've watched this man's work and I just love getting to talk to him. And so that's what we have on today's podcast. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. everybody welcome back to another episode of the mind of george show and this one is already set on course to be a doozy a little irresponsible probably full of laughs inappropriateness because it's in person because i have the pleasure of sitting down (laughs) with the egyptian drake the king of communication the skier of a medium besides snow that i cannot (laughs) say without getting in trouble The master of short form content, half of the dynamic duo that help people take over the internet. It's a fact. My dear friend Mo is here. The 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 honor and privilege is all mine, man. To be inside the mind of George, and I've been inside the mind of George for about two days now. (laughs) And uh, there's some terminology that they use when you're in the mind of George that I'm not going to say here because I don't know how much liberty (laughs) we have, but. uh, it's been a doozy in the best way. So I'm, I'm excited to have the space together, man, to jam. Doozy. Whatever you want, wherever you want to take us, it's all on the table. Doozy is a good one. Doozy. Yeah, it's, it's been the Matrix time. It's been the Matrix time. Yeah. And I love the intersection of some of your philosophies mixed in with the areas of our business that make me see myself again and make me recognize the areas that require a little bit more diligence in the areas that are like, dude, you're good here. Keep moving. You know? Yeah. So that's exciting that we're going to jam about wherever you take us. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's set some context. Sure. So I have the fortunate pleasure of kind of knowing your story, knowing how we get to like Mo of today. Yeah. Uh, and I set a little bit of context in your intro, but I think it would kind of be cool to hear from like now today you being, the master of communication you are in the work that you do in the application and the expression of that genius for a, a term, one of my tweetables that was written down today. Yes. But like, where did this begin to paint the picture to kind of where we are now to help everybody kind of understand? Yeah. How, how far back are we going on this? I'd say however far back you want for context that's relevant to you. Yeah, so I'm the son of two immigrants, Egyptian thoroughbred. You can go to Ancestry.com. It's Egyptian. Okay, (laughs) there is no, there is nothing else there involved. And my entire life was really dependent and based around education. So my mom is a PhD Mm -hmm. professor, and she teaches education from a feminist lens for third world countries, particularly how schools are structured. So what brought me to the States was her education. And from a young age, that was the path. The path was, you know, get your master's, get your PhD. That's what you're going to do. And it wasn't until after I'd finished my master's and was teaching at the, uh, at the college level that I realized this might not be exactly what I want to do. <laughs> so bachelor's in psych, master's in communication studies. And then after doing that, I was like, I don't know if this is exactly where I want to apply myself because I've always been artistic whether that's theater, music, rap, emceeing. 
And I was like, I had Gary Vee in my ear pretty heavy Mm -hmm. during that time. And I was like, could I do something that doesn't fit within the paradigm of education, which was very scary Mm -hmm. because that's all I knew. That's all I was shown. That's the privileges that I have today are because of the amazing person that is my mom. So I had to have like a sit down with her in Washington at a Thai restaurant. When I came to that conclusion, I said, listen, I'm not pursuing a PhD. Mm -hmm. And to my surprise, she was like, I've taught you what you needed to know to make decisions in your own life. And it's, Mm -hmm. you can, I trust you with whatever you do. And I was like, wait, wait, what? I've been like sitting here ruminating about this talk. The entire paradigm. (laughs) Like, but here's what's funny. Yeah. Your entire driving force (laughs) from this place of like fear Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in one moment was entirely collapsed and eradicated. Yeah. And it was totally in alignment with who she is as a professor and a teacher. And, you know, as the eldest son of two immigrant parents, you know, who came to the States, you put this pressure on yourself as like the prototype and I'm the prototype for everything in my family. So as far as like my cousins in that generation, but at that point I was really, really into vlogging Mm -hmm. and, you know, documenting, wanting to be a YouTuber influencer. So we started making vlogs on Snapchat of all places and businesses saw it. So this was the time where I was, I was like, okay, I'm going to take my quote unquote genius of communication and psychology, and I'm going to put it into a passion of mine, which has always been video Mm -hmm. and photography. And once businesses saw that, they were like, can you do that for us? And that just started snowballing, snowballing into now we do video content marketing in a very contained capacity, which is social media. Uh, It started off as a video production agency, and now we're just taking it into the video content marketing route. So that's the kind of short story of how everything that was now is. Now, when you say in the now you're taking into the video content marketing realm, just for context to everybody, does that mean you're focusing on creating short form content in the lens of social media and math and like continuing down the, the path of your mastery of that. Yeah. So the the focus is video. We've, we've, we specialize in short form, particularly across social, the three big channels, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube shorts. And we're entering into long form. Got it. Um, But really it's like, it's funny that you said in today's session with him, he said, this is a, the, the current expression of your genius. And our, <laughs> our tagline is helping thought leaders articulate their genius. Yep. So video happens to be the medium right now and we continue to expand. But that is, that is the bread and butter. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah, I think that helps kind of paint the picture because I was actually um, super stoked because I had been following on Instagram for months consuming your content, sharing it with my team. And then I got to keynote in Santa Monica and you were in the audience and we became like instant friends. So I was like, oh yeah, I had context for this guy already. I'm like, this is great. (laughs) He's legit. He's real. Okay, cool. Like good dude. Here we go. Ready to go. And I mean, hearing you present, hearing you speak, hearing you um, answer questions for people around content, around what you do. It's just like pure mastery. And I love it. Thank you, bro. And so like, I'm excited to kind of unpack too, because for people that listen to the show, I mean, it's all entrepreneurs, people that want to be, but I think first, before we even get into it, I'd love for you to share kind of your opinion or your theory on the importance of video yeah, and being able to communicate with video and understanding kind of what happens if you don't integrate it just from your lens and opinion and what you see, given that that's where you spend all your time. Yeah. So I look at video, I think a lot of people try to champion one form of medium. The reason why I love video as a communication medium is that it embodies all the ways that people learn. Mm -hmm. Like it's the closest thing to covering auditory learning, which is sound, uh, visual learning, which is learning with your eyes, and then kinesthetic learning, which is learning by doing. So what video allows you to do is tap into all of those mediums in one contained piece of uh, medium, I guess. And then you can turn it into all that other stuff, Yep. which is writing, which is audio, which is visuals, whatever that may be. So for anyone listening that's been on the fence, and if you're on the fence, then there's no better catalyst than the fact that video is, if you want stats, like the 98% used search tool in the world for anything. And it's only growing the more that platforms expand their video offering. So for me, that's number one. 
if you think about like content creation models, like Gary Vee has a model where he repurposes a long piece into multiple pieces, yep. or some people start with short form. If you're a busy person, and I know the classic entrepreneur who's really brilliant, doesn't have time, right? Doesn't want to recreate the wheel if it's already been created. So video allows you that perfect medium to then expand on and multiply over time. That's number one. Number two for me is just the natural communication model where you have messenger, message, and then receiver. Usually a message gets kind of convoluted because there's a lot of noise around it. So a beautiful example is like you're trying to have a conversation with somebody one-on-one at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. The restaurant is really loud. Yep. That noise conflicts with the message. Yep. Right? Sometimes it's internal noise, which is inside your head. Yep. You're a little fuzzy. So that conflicts with your delivery of it if you're the messenger. I think video is the cleanest form of medium to eliminate the noise. Yeah. Because you can expand contextually. So if you want to add things like B-roll, you can. If you want to uh, add animation, you can. If you want to add snippets of extra audio, if you want your delivery to shine on there, it allows you to eliminate as much noise as possible. So you as a messenger can then deliver a clean message to the receiver and then you get that feedback loop. Yeah. Which is such a beautiful thing because I know a lot of people listen to podcasts. We're on one right now. But there's something really special about the visual element of being able to really connect with that person that you don't hear unless the person is a master of their voice. Mm -hmm. When they're a master of their voice and they can inflect and they can say things in a way that actually like brings out that emotion in the other person, that's a good podcast like this one. But when you have video, your mannerisms are on camera, your yeah. hand, your, especially if you're, especially if it's a talking head and they get to really see like, the physical nonverbal communication happening yep. and that builds a much more intimate relationship. Sh something as simple as like, for those of you watching the video of the podcast, like George is wearing his pink glasses, he's wearing boots. Like, and when you see George often, you're like, yo, this is like his Steve jobs attire. This is George. And then you ask questions and then you go down the path. Like he's in Montana. This isn't that. Then you start connecting over little things. Yep. Like I love his glasses. Where did he get those glasses? Yep. And that brings us to like customer journey and all that kind of stuff where, right. It builds relationships at the end of the day, that visual. Element. So those are my two parts as to why I think video is yeah, and I, and, powerful. and I love it because I, I want to stay in kind of the the what and why for a minute mm -hmm. because I, I feel like the more evidence we give people, but also talk and explore about this, kind of the more everybody gets it because I, I also feel like um, understanding the power of video and for all the reasons and yeah. including the types of video, which don't always mean that you have to be standing in front of a camera and talking yeah. with your face. And and because I think there's a lot of like fear that I still hear on the daily basis, right? When I get hit with entrepreneurs and I'm making recommendations on how to solve their challenges, there's still like a lot of that, like, but I don't want to be on camera or right. I don't. And I feel like now there's so many creative ways to mitigate that in ways to communicate that aren't really talked about. So people just kind of don't get it. So true. And don't pick this path. So I think for first, I kind of want to talk about, and, and, and I'm going to ask you specifically about this because of your kind of major and focus in life uh, around this form. And one of the reasons that I think video has always been so powerful for me, and it took me a lot of years in hindsight to recognize this, but I feel like one of the only reasons I became successful as an entrepreneur is because I had a lot of trouble communicating in words, my feelings authentically. Mm -hmm. And I just leveraged video because it felt like my easiest form of expression, but it feels like it allowed people to get me because of all the forms of communication that are nonverbal. Yeah. Yeah. And I see that now, but I feel like a lot of people miss and like just don't really understand how much of it is mm -hmm. and how much you can do kind of creatively. So I'd kind of love for you to talk in your opinion from a lens of human communication, but also through the lens of like creating content mm -hmm. to communicate with the world of like the importance of understanding nonverbal communication and what mm -hmm. can be expressed, but also like some creative ways or things to think about. Like I have like a color psychologist on my staff and yeah. we, we plan these glasses and my pink Timberlands and like everything yeah. is done to elicit something in one of those little buckets of communication that carries so much weight, yeah. but sometimes don't get a lot of intention. This is so funny because when our videos started blowing up, there were little things that we did mm -hmm. 
very that no one would consider variables for the success of the video. Yes. So I'll share with them and I'll share with you what they were. And a lot of them were tied into not even the script, not even the like that. I can get into that all day because that's very important. Yes. But like I had to first and foremost get rid of two things. So you'll notice about me when I'm talking, I try to like give you as much context at first before giving you the answer. So bear with me here. But num- number one is if you are going to make the intention and set the intention that you will use video for your business, just know and give yourself the grace that it's going to be an iterative process and it's yes. going to take time yep. because there's a lot of things that you are going to learn throughout that process, like your comfort on camera, your ability to articulate a message that has both depth and brevity. Um, then you're going to pick up things about videography if you're doing it solo. If you're not doing it solo, you're going to have to learn a little bit to at least hire the right people. So number one, set that intention and give yourself that grace. Number two is delineate between two types of anxiety that come up <laughs> from <laughs> being on video. Number one, we usually go into video with a performance-centered mindset. So a performance-centered mindset is when you base the success of the video off of your performance. Your, uh, the ability to be liked by the audience. The problem with that is that puts you in a severe state of anxiety because the last thing you can control a hundred percent, you can control a little bit of it, but is how the audience is going to react to you Mm -hmm. without iteration of the process and the videos that you put out. So you want to take yourself from a performance, like, will they like me? Will I do good? Will I give them a show? Ra, ra, ra to a message centered approach. Mm -hmm. And you're going to love this because you're all about fucking customer journey and all of that stuff. So it's like message centered approach like means is my message written and articulated in a way that the audience can best understand. So I'm already developing the message that I'm going to put out on video with the person in mind to make sure that whatever I present, they fully understand. And guess what happens then? They actually leave liking you more because you've provided clarity. Mm. So that's number one, like set the intention that it's going to be somewhat challenging. Number two is if you can get your message dialed before all the performance stuff, you can fix the performance stuff later. Mm -hmm. But let me answer the question you asked about like nonverbal and cobs and whatnot. Stereotypes work Mm -hmm. in this situation because people understand like life through stereotypes. So like think about all the different ways that you've been able to categorize people. Mm Mm-hmm categorize celebrities, categorize certain pockets of the United States if you live in the United States, right? It's usually a testament to how people are dressed, how people are talking, how people are moving, what they're driving, right? So this this is tying into brand. Like, Ask yourself, what do you want to put in the video that is an extension of who you are? Mm-hmm. So we literally were, in, on my channel, we were like, posting amazing stuff message wise. And I was like, the message is good. Something is off, you know? And then I was like, you know what? I'm dialing in the set. I have nothing but hieroglyphics behind me, which is very Egyptian. I have like, uh, my fraternity thing in the background on a shelf, uh, a, a statue of something like from Egypt. I think it's the Sphinx. I'm trying to remember. And then I was like, yo, I love fashion. And there was a moment where I had to get out of like depression and like the very deep moment where I like forgot the things that I loved mm. by myself. I let them go. And I was like, so I started being like, yo, I'm going to unapologetically do everything that if someone were to pick me out of a crowd, they know it's me. So I started, I literally started putting on the hats that I wear. My beard was in like full form. Cause everyone talks about that. Started putting things in the foreground of the scene that people could talk about using props And now everyone's like, your video looks so dialed. But what they're actually communicating is your video looks congruent with the personality I see on camera. Yep. Therefore, they feel more connected to me. Yep. So here's where things get really funny with all this. It's the paradox principle. If you are somebody who's about to start a video, your immediate thought is, I'm going to be performance-based. They need to love me. So you go into everything that doesn't make you you. Yep. Let me be Ron Burgundy on screen. Let me talk a certain way. Let me dress really fucking corporate so people can know that I'm a pro. And you do all of these things that dilute yep, who, you, who are. you actually are. So yep. I could give you the how and give you like frameworks on what to put in your set, but it's very simple. It's like, what is an extension of you? 
And what do you want people to know about when it comes to you? And the reason why it's the paradox principle is because what you think will push people away is what will actually bring people closer to you. 1000%. So that's the, like, if you want to know, like, what to do nonverbal communication is like, be a hundred percent yourself. I know that sounds very cliche, right? Have a clear message. Everything else you can optimize moving forward, your communication style, the set, all these things, but make that commitment to express yourself. Well, <clears throat> to even give some more weight to what you said is that that is actually the required foundation to iterate and make it work. 100%. Because regardless, uh, and to not be you know philosophical about this, but I find that most people get to that authentic expression either through choice or through yeah. response to pain. Yeah. Something stops working, something out of alignment, no team is doing something. Mm -hmm. And it's typically boiling down to somebody finding a misalignment and not checking it quick enough or proactively enough yeah. to, to boil down there. So I think that that's huge. And it's funny you said, so, you know, the how, but like, for everybody listening, if you go listen to that again about that video part and what you broke down, that is actually a step-by-step -step how on how to have an authentic expression inside of your messaging, inside of your videos, and inside of your business. And right. so like the how is, is in there. And I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, and I also love when you talk about you know performance-driven versus messaging driven mm -hmm. um you know for everybody listening to this in the lens of like what we teach we talk about customer journey i talk a lot about this like i refer to things transactionally or transformationally yeah right yeah. and <clears throat> what's really really funny is the, the other paradox inside of like <laughs> the performance-based video where you have every intention on helping somebody you yes. have every intention on serving them you have every intention on like really filling their bucket and then you get lost in that performance driven how yep and then the best intention comes across on their side as transactional 100% or as manipulative and then it creates even more frustration on our side yep. which makes us feel even more unaligned dude because of that authentic 100%. messaging 100% yeah 100 let's take i want to take this to like because if there's somebody right now who's been on the fence about creating video content let's just let's just be 100 percent real with each other you care about what other people think yes 1, and i know that sounds like oh here's another fucking entrepreneur saying that it took me the longest to even accept that statement because it's so high level but let's really narrow down why that is as human beings we strive for social belongingness Yep. All we want is to build relationships where we feel seen, acknowledged, loved, mm -hmm. and heard because the alternative, like biologically, is the equivalent of real pain. Your brain, yep. when, they, when it feels isolation, it equates it to like being punched in the stomach. Yep. The problem is when we operate from that paradigm for video, we go straight to a performance-based mindset and then we start creating all these arbitrary reasons for either why people will like us or why they won't like us. And then there's only... I love how this is tying into everything we've talked about today that none of you know about, but I just had to say that out loud. <laughs> because you're asking yourself the wrong question. It's like, what do I need to make to either avoid the pain of somebody not liking me? Or oh. what do I need to make to make somebody like me? Mm -hmm. The problem is either direction is going to take you down a path that is inauthentic. Yep. Because <laughs> you're overestimating the, the need to please the audience when in reality... Going in with this intention of like, I could care less how the audience feels about me. What I care about is, do they understand? Yep. And am I expressing that message in the way that I would if I was in a conference room with multiple people by myself, thinking to myself or talking one-on-one? -on -one? Yes. So, and, and you have to go through this exercise like, because as soon as you put yourself out there, by the way, and this is a, th <laughs> a, a, a th thought that I haven't fully explored just yet, but like... The criticism and the love is inevitable. 1,000%. That is the only guarantee. Guaranteed. So we don't even need to make decisions off of that. No. We just need to go and focus on the clarity of like how we're presenting and what we're saying. The only thing that makes the criticism ineffective or effective, regardless of its existence, is your true alignment <laughs> to your truth. That's a fact. And it's so funny because like even when you were referencing to everybody else, I was thinking <laughs> through hundreds of moments of my life where 
in the moment, I was like, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but this is real. And then every time I did it, it turned into one of the best decisions every time. I've ever made. And even if it wasn't immediate where like, because I said it, it kind of created some roadblocks or some challenges. It ultimately always ended up perfect or exactly where it was supposed to. And it's like, I was like, kind of like laughing on the inside, thinking about it as you said it, because I remember early on as an entrepreneur, when I started getting success and started, you know, making a name for myself as all yeah. I cared about was what everybody thought. Yeah. Right. And so my, my performance as an entrepreneur was all for everybody else's edification. And, uh, you know, like, I just remember the weight of trying to remember the lie. So heavy. I remember the pressure of like trying to remember the story. And it got to a point where none of it was out of ill intent. I just couldn't even find the line anymore between who I was, mm. who I thought I was, who the world thought I was, who my family thought I was. And like, it was like an identity crisis. Yeah. And that was one of the big things that sparked me taking sabbaticals and then walking away. Yeah. Because it was just to the point where there was no path for me to find it. Like yeah. there was one path out and that book had to be closed. And so, yeah, it's crazy. Well, you, and you see it with influencers all the time. Well, they'll have a sprint of doing things and then they'll come out with an apology video yes. being like, I'm burnt out or I didn't even want to be doing this. I was saving face and I was trying to be something I'm not. And we see these cyclical patterns of behavior on other people and we assume ourselves to be exceptional. Yep. It's like, you're not an exception to the rule. Look at the data in front of you. You can see it. I've gone through the burnout. Yeah, I still go to the burnout. I've taken a, I've taken a six month sabbatical from content because of reasons related to my business that me and <laughs> George have unlocked these past two days. But the only way to sustain this video game particularly is to just make it an extension of who you are. And I'll give you an example. We have a client, one of his highest performing videos did about 25 million views on TikTok, right? Everyone should just go look up, look up any viral video that has a person as a talking head in there. And then just open the comments. You're going to see one camp being cynics, just bashing the creator. Yep. The other camp is going to be asking questions. The other camp is going to be praising. So if we were to just be like, well, this is a viral video. All the comments should be positive. It's like, no. And the funny part is that client, before we published the video, we got his, he was like, I don't like how my suit jacket looks. And I was like, just trust me on this one. We're going to publish this out. And he like, he's a very receptive person and he pushes us. So like we put it out and it's his highest performing today. And like some people will say your suit is too tight. Some people will say your suit is too big. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. And the message is clear and you can't fake your true self. No. So that's where my head's at with that one. Well, and, and let's for a minute, let's talk about marketing. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Let's just talk about the correlation and the, the part of that statement on the side of the fear side on fear of what people might say or fear of the criticism and understand that at the core, uh, marketing is ineffective unless there is about 20% pol polarity. Yeah. Like the end. And at the core, I think what everybody must understand is that the intention of marketing is to create messaging, both verbal and nonverbal, that elicits an emotional response. Yeah with zero control over what emotion is elicited <laughs> in yeah. hopes of gaining somebody's interest or attention to either move them towards pleasure or away from pain yep, that's it. in an area of their life with about 90% of them being more on the away from pain side. Yeah. And then the one thing we worry about is the one thing that actually prevents your marketing from working being effective. And then everybody calls me and says, George, my marketing won't work. I'm like, just fucking tell them the truth and it will work. Tell them the truth. But I just think that's an, an interesting thought process to like really think through that. I think, I think you're a hundred percent right. And, and I do, I study a lot of the people in the game 
from an influencer perspective that I really love what they're doing. And I got to give him the credit. There's a gentleman by the name of Prince Donnell, um, not to take the spotlight away from me because I love that you're talking with me, but <laughs> just to give him the credit to cite the sources. And he had a class, a beginner class teaching about content. For, it was like an hour long class. The first 45 minutes were about like being okay with your truth. Literally, it's just this filtration process of like owning that and coming to the front lines and doing that because the video is the medium. Yeah. It's the tactic for the amplification of you or your business. 1000%. So like, that's why, that's why the like first section of anything that I do with my clients is like, what is the truth here behind your personal brand? Who are we trying to target? What are you willing to say? And are you okay with the pushback that'll come from the market, especially when our main objective is to take you viral? For sure. And and I think there's one more maybe important step to talk about here too as well. Um, and maybe just call out. I think what we can summarize is one big takeaway of a lot about what we just shared is that the criticism and the critique is inevitable. 100%. And one of the tenets in being able to succeed with it is being proactive and understanding prior to you utilizing video or any other medium as a modality to help increase the visibility of your business, knowing that you want to go viral, you want to get it picked up, and understanding that when that happens, no matter what you do, it's coming in. Yeah. And so we know it's there. And so the success of it comes down to, number one, making sure that what you're sharing with the world, you're in full alignment with. and that So true. You are, but also those on your team. Mm-hmm. are not just aware of their job, but they're aware of the movement and what you guys stand for and how you speak about things and how you respond to things and how you DM about things and how you do customer service about things. Mm-hmm. So there's a unified stance within the organization, including with your 1099s, including with the people that help you with things. 100%. So that you feel like you have a solid foundation. And then... Now that we know it's inevitable, you're also in alignment. So now the game is simple. When it happens, what is our response? And the only way to win this game is to just pre-plan what that might be. Well, let's think through every conceivable scenario. What is the absolute worst that can happen? Like, (laughs) (laughs) what is the likelihood of us being fully canceled in 24 hours? You know, boom, 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 right? What's your cancel barometer looking like? Yep. And really just... Give yourself the space to think through it. Even if it seems like it's mild, if you even have the thought of like, oh, I wonder if someone's going to be upset. Mm -hmm. You just give yourself the tool. So when it happens, you're like, okay, cool. Oh, okay. Got it. I already thought about this. Here's where we go. At least here's a direction to head into. And I think that that's a really, really important thing. Um, So I just wanted to call that out. So now I would say in another part of what we talked about, I think we could agree that authenticity is... Um, kind of the number one foundational piece for video, but for messaging alignment congruence in general. 100%. So now in the lens of communication through video and short form content, we can agree that authenticity is a core component. What are some of the other core components that make video, the use of video, an effective communication tool for people? What makes video more of an effective tool for people? Well, I think... so. If I'm understanding the question correctly, like what components should go in the video? Yeah, to like make what are other foundational, like important yeah, yeah, yeah. components is a better way. That was yeah. my inability to communicate effectively. Oh, I'm just trying to understand. No, thanks uh, for calling me out without calling me out, dog. That's uh, leadership. No, <laughs> number, number one, you have to understand the state of the consumer. So remember, if you just think of, if you think of communication as on one side, there's a ball, you call that the messenger. In the middle, there's this dotted line. That's the message. And it's connected to another ball that's the receiver. We have to understand environmentally where the receiver is when it comes to online content. So here's the mistake everybody makes. The mistake everybody makes is they think that people care. People do not care. When they're an unknown audience, they do not care. Yet. Beautiful hyphen yet. So your objective is to make them care. Therefore, the makeup of your video has to be done in a way to either, well, not either, Two things. Capture attention. Number one, create curiosity. You can remember it with this acronym, CACTUS. So if you've ever seen a cactus, (laughs) for some odd reason, your body goes into, oh my God, I want to touch it. 
Is it sharp? Is it pointy? Will it poke? And you are just gravitated toward the cactus. So here's what cactus I, stands I for. I don't have that. You're not Egyptian. So anyways, <laughs> uh, <laughs> CA, capture attention. Okay. <laughs> I'm dying over here. <laughs> capture attention, curiosity until, um, until they stay. That's, that's, that's it. I think I'm remembering my capture opinion. attention, capture attention and curiosity, curiosity until they stay until they stay. That sounds right. That sounds right. Yeah. Uh, you will write it in the show notes. If I'm remembering my acronym incorrectly, the point is capture attention and create curiosity. So your goal is to help them stop scrolling or click on your video. And then everything in that first three seconds needs to create the curiosity that leads them to stay for the video. So I'll paint a picture of what you're doing wrong and what you should do instead. A lot of you are coming on this video, whether it's a short form piece or long form piece. And you're like, Hey y'all just wanted to hop in, check in with you, make sure you're good. Uh, my name is such and such. Like nobody cares. We've lost you already. We've lost you. Like you're not impolite if you don't do that. So what I want you to do is just jump straight into what's called a hook. A lot of people throw that term around, but they never actually on, explain Before, before we do is. that, can we just raise our hands if we're guilty of that? Yeah. Because I'm raise, putting two in the air right now for everybody. Hold you, on. I just want to give... Every, hold on. <laughs> you I know it. You've seen it in someone's I wanna, story. I want to give everybody a permission slip that I started making content, I think, in 2010 on video. And I think you will find all the evidence of my guilt of that until, of until about 2020. <laughs> All of us. And I think it took me a full decade yeah. to get that. So I just wanted everybody else to like feel a little bit better about yourself because I've been doing that the wrong way for a long time. Don't feel bad. That's what everybody... Because we are wired to build relationships. So we assume that we have to make pleasantries with the other person for them to listen to us. I think, I think what eventually clicked for me is that um, when you walk up to somebody... You know, in your day to day, you have eye contact, you have yes. body language, you have, did we glance at each other? Was there any context for this so conversation? Much. That's not happening online. To the point where I'm not going to walk up and it'd be like, if you do that one more time, you're guaranteed to die seven years later yeah, yeah, yeah. or younger, right? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like in speaking in hook, or yeah. it's like eight out of 10 adults suffer from that condition you have right now. <laughs> Like, can you imagine? Here's three tips to save money for the rest should, of your life. We should do an Instagram series called Hooks in Real Life. And then just, and just walk up to strangers and drop hooks <laughs> on them contextually to like something they're wearing so good. or doing. So good. We should really explore we sh that. We should. Um, I f Honestly, though, it would be effective in real life. That's why That's why interviews on the streets work. I know. And I think... I think You're so right. Where I was going with that is that I, I think what it took me a little while to understand is that... Um, I just look, have to look at the context or what I started to do is look at the context of my relationship online yeah. where I was earning the right to exchange the pleasantries. But at first it required the context to get the attention. Beautiful. Way and I was like, so how can I create the stare or the nudge or the moment that we would exchange on the airplane or getting on yes. the car rental shuttle? And how can I do that online? hundred percent. And that's how I started to think about it. hundred percent. And you got to think about like, and this is where George's teachings about customer journey really come into play. And you don't have to have some elaborate framework to nope. think about this. Just really think about yourself when you're on the phone or when you're on the computer. Yep. Just take a second right now while you're listening, ask yourself, what is my default state when I'm on social or when I'm on YouTube? And I'll paint a few for you. Usually you're next to your spouse yep. in bed, late at night, watching something with your headphones on or on mute, literally passing time. Yep. There is no intention. You are what they call the mindless scrolling, mm -hmm. right? So that's one thing. The other thing is you're having a problem that you're facing right now and Google just became your best friend and you're actively searching for things in the terms that you understand. So when we know that those are the two primary modes that somebody is watching content in, we have to appease that mode. So I want you to translate being polite in video as being very responsive and quick. When you save someone time in capturing their attention, they actually admire you without all the pleasantries that took you 15 seconds. So let's talk about what a hook is, right? In educational content, I'm not going to go into the details of like no. the editing of a hook or the visual element. We're just going to talk about like if you needed to say something in a talking head educational video that is related to your business, 
what should that include? So the hook is the first three to five seconds of data that the end consumer receives from your video. Now, everyone thinks it's just that what comes out of your mouth, it's two parts. The hook contains the title or the headline. And the second part is what's called an attention getter. And that's a speech term. So the headline or title, when you think of YouTube, it's the thumbnail Mm -hmm. or it's the actual title. Mm -hmm. That is what provokes you to click on something. That's why click-through rate of something is so important in the video world. So we want to have a good headline. And we can talk about frameworks in a second about headlines. The second thing is what is the, the attention getter is the first thing out of your mouth that you say. So when we're teaching public speaking, we say, don't, don't go on stage and say, hi, how's everybody doing? Just get to it immediately. Yep. Yep. And the attention getter should be something that evokes tension in the audience where they are seeking a solution. So I'll contextualize this. Say, for example, that um, you're somebody who's a health coach right? And you want to talk about caloric deficit. Your hook should be something that makes the audience want what you have to give them. So you're not giving them the answer immediately, but you're creating this tension. I call it the tease gap. So what you're going to say is something like, um, here's an easy way for you to fit into that bikini that you've been eyeing. Mm -hmm. The tension I've created is, oh my God, how do I get my desired future state, which is the bikini and fit into it, Versus where I'm currently at. Mm -hmm. The gap, that tease gap that you've created is the solution that you have that you have yet to share. Yep. Here's a tool I will give you for you to fit into this. So it's like, if I've captured your attention because I said what you wanted, right? My curiosity that I've created in you now is, please tell me the tool. Yep. So whenever, if you should spend any time building your video out... If the information is solid, good, but focus the 98% of your time in that headline and that opening attention getter. A couple of summaries real quick and an important point on this one. Um, So the hook isn't the first word. It's the first thing, meaning contextually, the thing that you hit them in that first three to five seconds. 100%. So I'm just summarizing that for everybody else. It's that two-piece chicken combo. It's the two-piece. The title and the attention getter. The title and the attention getter. So like on YouTube, that would be the title video and the thumbnail. Yep. On Instagram, if they're just seeing it as they're scrolling through Correct. reels, it's only the audio and visual hook. Yes. If they're scrolling through your timeline, it's the thumbnail. Correct. Right? So that's where that contextually makes sense. And I think what I wanted to elaborate on and have you talk about the importance of that you were just talking about that and you were saying like 98% of your video, focus on the hook, focus on 100%. the hook. I think it's important to talk about the structure of like even recording a video and understanding when to hit record because yeah. for years, nine years, I recorded video first and then went hook and title after. Yeah. And I feel like I just made an uphill battle for no fucking reason for lack of better terms. Yeah. Now I only record a video if we have a hook Yeah. and we have a title <laughs> and I know clearly what their takeaway is going to be. And then I record. Yeah. And so I think it's a good point before we get into kind of title structure for everybody to expand upon that. Yeah. So there's actually two methods to this. I don't know who made you feel bad that that was a bad method. That wasn't a bad method. I just feel like in comparison (laughs) to how easy it It is is for me now. (laughs) So there's, there's two concepts and I learned both of them from academia, which is you can either start with the tail or you can start with the head. So we'll break that down here in just a second. But if you've ever written an academic paper in your life... I haven't. Okay, cool. So you are not the person I'm talking... If you've written anything where there was a mentor that edited it for you, you might have heard them say, write the paper first, then write the introduction. Yes. Because it's much easier to synthesize the introduction after you have all the data. So that's operating with the tail in mind. Yes. Meaning, what is the takeaway that I want to give people in this video? Oh, we do that. Right. So you start with the tail in mind, that takeaway, and then you ask yourself, what is the best way to contextualize this on the front for people to actually reach it? Yes. So you build the hook or the title or the headline off of the key takeaway. Yes. Then there's operating with the The head head. first, which is, and a lot of good magazine writers, a lot of good uh, blog writers, they start with this. What is the title? Yeah. Build everything into it. Yeah. So for example, if you're thinking about the mistakes you want to talk about and you're like, okay, I want to help them avoid this. The title is going to be three mistakes to avoid blah. You may not know the mistakes just yet, but you, that title is so clear. It's like, okay, I want to navigate my research into a place that teaches these three mistakes. 
So just think of it. If you're a tail person where you like to research first, map out everything, clear takeaway, and then experiment with hooks, great. Some people are just very gifted at the gift of gab and copywriting yep. and they've studied that. And it's like, let me write out all the different hooks for this vague idea that I kind of yep. have right now. Yeah. And then we can build into it. Usually it's a hybrid of the two where you're coming really well with each other. Well, so what I was alluding to is what I used to do is like, I would just like go live. Oh yeah. And then I would just start talking. Yeah. yeah. And then eventually I would, I would end up creating structure in my brain or in the video and <laughs> yeah. landing the plane. Yeah. You know, with about 80% inefficiency. And then I would try to chop that out. But there was just so much yeah. bloat yes. in the way, right? So that's what I was talking about. In the lens of how you answered it, which I love, is I operate, I'd say 50-50. Yeah. You know, like when we talk about everybody here in the lens of like marketing and customer journey, and even to kind of close the gap earlier when you were talking about messaging, and one of the core components is knowing who you're speaking to. Shh. And Very part true. of building that bridge is knowing what you're speaking about. Yes. And so in that lens, once you kind of hit those three pillars, right? And it's it's normally three for everybody in some summary, right? Mindsets, minds, mindset, customer journey, and relationships, right? Uh, or some hybrid of those. But once I have those, <clears throat> then I kind of know the core messaging, the core principles, and the movement that my business is being built mm -hmm. on, right? That kind of the making it about the message versus making it 100%. about the performance, right? So those components are there. And so then knowing that I pick how I want to teach and that messaging, those components come a part of my proactive messaging. And that's typically where I start tail back. Yeah. Because I'm like, here's what I want to teach. Here's how I want to get them there. This yeah. is where it would go in a lead magnet. This is where it would go in an offer. This is how I talk about it on my podcast. Okay, cool. Well, that one idea just turned into this entire ecosystem. 100%. Tail first. So what are the 10 big pain points expressed in an entrepreneur's life? that I know to be true. Mm -hmm. And now how can I make that a hook, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, this one five minute tip will yeah. save you an hour in your business. Uh, this one breath technique will help you fire an employee without beating yourself up, which mm -hmm. I've actually done those ones. And so then I pick that way, right? So that's what I do about 50% of the time. Yeah. Then understanding that my core messaging is kind of the home that I want people to exist in, but that home doesn't naturally exist for most people because they don't speak the same language that I do. Mm -hmm. So that home is what creates my consistent, let's call it heartbeat. Yeah. So that when I get their attention or they come into my ecosystem, that's where they exist. Mm -hmm. And so then I know my messaging. And so then I go attack the head and I go read comments and I go read responses and I go look at videos that are going viral. And I go to tools like answer the public and I type in All that. Uh, burnout or entrepreneur adrenal fatigue or uh, bad mindset or blank. And then I hit their specific search terms that they type in YouTube and in Google. Mm -hmm. And then I start with the head and I'm like, that's the pain. Yep. What in my messaging, what in my thing do I have to offer Hundred percent. in that core umbrella can I use to bridge the gap? And like, what's the one place I can send them yep. or the one next thing I can give them, whether it's read a book or do an exercise that moves them closer. And so that's how I actually use those two. hundred percent, hundred percent. And to, to help people that maybe this actually works, whether you're early in your journey mm -hmm, or, or mm -hmm. in the middle of your journey, there's a framework uh, that we put together. It's called the iced framework. So I C E D. Iced. And the beautiful thing about ice is like when you're, when you're iced out, you're fresh. So you'll get to a really cool, <laughs> like cool conclusion, but also iced is like, just freeze for a second. Yep. And then this is how you would map out how you do video. So I'll share with you the framework, but I'll share the mistake that people do, which is a mistake that I was notorious for just because of my own ability to produce this kind of stuff. You want to, I, you want to like have the idea write it out, film it, edit it, send it out all in one sitting. And you always say consistency beats intensity. That's an intensity way of doing something yes. that is not sustainable. No, it's not sustainable. <laughs> I used to do Unless that. Unless you're really good and you have everything else mapped out to where you can do that in one sitting. So iced breaks it down. The first, the I is ideate. Just spend time in isolation ideating. And there's multiple ways to do that. Number one is the brain dump. And there's different pillars that you can categorize things into, but sit down and ask yourself, what are frequently asked questions that my people ask me? What are knowledge gaps that I know the person that I'm serving, if they know this information, they would be better served. What are some problems that people are constantly having in my world? And just 
brain dump. Mm -hmm. This is what my team and I call IP extraction. You're extracting your intellectual property. And this requires you to be a student consumer, not just a passive consumer. So when something happens to you on a client call, if something happens to you in, if you're watching something, if you're reading a book, have something that you can take notes on quickly, IP extract right away, or have intentional time to ideate. The other piece of ideation is go see what's already working in your niche. This does not make you a plagiarist. This does not make you someone who cannot think on their own. This just allows you to see where people's attention already is. Yes. And if you're just starting out, that should be your only strategy. You go to the best person in your field. Yep. You look at the history of their content, not their current content, because now they're doing uh, personal brand stuff versus yep. ec education. Go back 10 years when they first started. What were they publishing? And it's evergreen content that people, and then give it your spin. Then CED, so create, which is filming, right? Or scripting, I dedicate time to doing just that. And then edit in batch. You should have either an editor or if you are the editor, just edit. And then distribute, which is distribution. Mm -hmm. When you can isolate, the, isolate those components, you're actually tapping into a specific part of your brain that is tailored for those pieces. Mm -hmm. So you're dedicating ideation time, filming time, editing time, distribution time. I want to hit a point on something you said about like the plagiarism part because I feel like a lot of people kind of get stuck here and, yeah. and I, and I kind of pull the wool back on this curtain for a lot of people because it, it kind of pisses me off. I don't give a fuck which way you slice it. I call it customer journey. Yeah. Some people call it funnels. Some people yeah. call it email marketing. Some people call it blank. And if you were to look at the core, we probably all have 50% overlap in core teachings. Easy. Minimum, right? It's not the knowledge itself that makes it valuable. It's the application through your perspective mm. that makes it valuable. So good. Because you see it from a different lens, which allows you to break it down and help other people who see it from a different lens achieve a result that they cannot or could not through a different person, a different modality, or a different view. Facts. And so I want everybody to hear that first to understand. Like, I was a food blogger and I always used to get so... I, I, I thought it was hilarious. I was watching these food bloggers have meltdowns and have like attorney staffs of like four. And they're like, well, <laughs> these people are stealing my recipes and they're copying and they're boom. And I was like, motherfucker, none of us have original recipes. Like a pound cake's been a pound cake for 5,000 years. And I was like, what are you getting upset about? Like, I, if listen, if my life is to the point where I can't sleep at night because people are copying and pasting my recipe on their website. Like I just right. shouldn't do this anymore. But I think for a lot of people, like you gotta, you gotta recognize like you have a gift. If you see something away, if you did something away that helped you, if you did something a different way than somebody else taught you and it made your life better or it was easier for you. Yeah. If you know something that somebody doesn't know, when you go out, I think one of the, biggest components to winning this game of entrepreneurship is being willing to do an audit of the game that you're about to play. Facts. And when I look at doing research and competitive research, what I'm looking at is like, what mistakes can I avoid? Like, what are they doing that I know they invested millions of dollars in already that's working? Yep. And I have tools like archive.org that I can go see an entire website's history. Yeah. And I can go to built with and see what tools they're using on their website and I can go to their social and I can look at the last 60 days of their content and be like, wow, every time they talk about this thing about mindset, it goes bananas. Every time they talk about this thing about habits, it goes bananas. Fuck, I can talk about that thing my way. Screw it. I'm going to start talking about that on my channel. And then I'm going to go start engaging in the comments on all of their 100%. videos about mindset with people. 100%. And so I just wanted to say like, to your point, I think it's important for everybody to understand that the field exists. The content's being out there. There's not a lack of information. All the information's out there. And, and what most people want, they can get for free if they're willing to look for it. 100%. But the reason they're looking for it is because they're looking for somebody to help hold them accountable to executing against it once they find it. Yeah. So they're looking for your specific authentic voice yes. and authentic message that humanizes you, that allows them to connect with you on a level outside of a transaction that sees your hat in your video or sees your pink glasses and pink Tims and you look like a fucking hot mess cowboy in Montana. <laughs> 
and, and they can only hear it from you, by the way. Like, I just want to stop right here. I think a lot of us look at content from other people and we say like, well, someone's already doing it. I can't mm-hmm. talk about it. It's like, no, dog. Just seriously, I can't tell you how many coaches I've had say the same thing to me, but only two of them have resonated. 1,000%. When they have said the same exact thing, you call it uh, same philosophies in a different rapper. Yeah. Like I, I say there's someone out there that you do not know that can only hear what they need to hear to change their life and only receive it from you. Yes. That is a burden that you have to bear because I'm an Egyptian American man. For example, there's, I can't talk to everybody. Someone's going to want to listen to George. Somebody's going to want to see me in my beard. We may be saying the same thing, but they literally cannot yep. hear it from anybody other than me when I say it and vice versa. 1,000%. And there's, a, there's another layer to this, which I'm now geeked up. The coffee's hitting me, so I'm going to go for this right now <laughs> based on what you're saying. This is two things. Number one, my, one of my business coaches, Chris Doe, he says, if you are trying to be in a business where you're one of one, then you are working an uphill battle. So unless you want to be the Elon Musk or the Amazons of the world and you are trying to be the disruptor of the disruptors, Godspeed, I wish you the best. But a big part of like understanding your market is their demand for what it is that you're talking about. Yep. This is part of the game. Researching the landscape of other creators, other niches is for you to be able to isolate what you want to talk about. So that's number one. Number two is the academic in me just flared up. Be, when you're trying to write a thesis for your career Mm -hmm. to get your PhD or to get your master's or to get your undergrad even, you have to first provide a proposal for what you're going to research and what you're going to experiment Mm. on so they can give you the budget, so they can assign you the right um, committee, so they can assign you the right um, uh, reviewer, all that kind of stuff. Within that proposal, the primary thing that they look at is your literature review. What's a literature review? It's you literally researching existing literature that's out there, quoting it, saying how yours is going to be different, how what you're going to add to the market, what conclusions you're going to come up with. Because they want to see if the literature, there's already enough breadth in there Mm -hmm. and if there's something new that you're adding to the table. Mm. And you need to give them that literature review, like such and such scholar said this, they came up with this theory and this experiment. This is the conclusion they found. What we're trying to do is X. So just think about that Mm. when you're doing content instead of your natural disposition being like, well, someone else is already doing it. No, it's because someone else is doing it Mm. that you have a position in the space Mm -hmm. to add to the information Mm. and expand. And also I say this all the time, like experiment publicly, which is you are making this content to also find your own voice. 1000%. And you got it. Like, if you go to my page, you're going to see when I shit the bed all the way to when I figured it out and I don't archive shit. Yeah. Because I want somebody who's just starting out to come over and be like, hmm, this was the breaking point where he really figured it out. Yeah. Well, let's give context what was shitting the bed and what was like, oh, he figured it out. It's relative to you, right? Shitting the bed as in like, oh, I can see him. Oh, no, no. I mean, like, I mean, like where you started to where you ended up, like even view wise, like in the beginning when you started. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Like, my mom and a few friends and some like hundred views blurry ass video you could scroll down and then now we're like hitting millions of views Is yeah what well you what's your instagram so everybody can go scroll mo down. isma m-o-i-s-m-a-i so you can go scroll you can see the framing was off you can see there's a lot of iterative like finding my own voice like trying this creator style trying my style adding my things in there and then you see it hits this curve where there's a level of consistency in look and feel. Yeah. There's a level of consistency in the delivery. But it was only through all of the experimentation publicly that I could find that pocket well, and from that, that rhythm. That's what I wanted to talk about, right? Because I, I, I think one of the only reasons that I found success early on is because I only had the option to fail forward. Right. I didn't have the ability to like plan a set or build a studio, like even as a food blogger. Yeah. If you go look at like the 2010 photos, they were taken on a flip phone. Yeah. And then two point and shoots that were $100 each until I could afford the first $400 DLSR. And then I shot a 22 week New York Times bestselling cookbook on a $460 camera and won awards for the food photos. And so I only succeeded because my environment dictated that that was the only way that I could accomplish it at the time. So good. And I feel like that was a blessing now because that taught me very early on that a lot of the things that I was 
afraid of or a lot of the clarity that I was looking for, I could only find through 100%. public expression 100%. and public feedback. And there was only so much work I could do on my voice or my message or my clarity before I was clear on what it was, but really what I was looking for is what's the language or what's the wording or what's the the tone or the dialect or the way in which to speak about this so that other yeah. people can hear it. And there's really only one way to figure that out. It's to do it. And it's to do it. <laughs> and it's to talk to as many people as possible. 100%. And so I, I love this concept and, and I, I live by this concept, but I would love for you to kind of talk about the importance of that because... I, like you, will not delete things. I will not reshoot them. I will not edit these podcasts. I'm like, nope, sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> that was hilarious. Uh, we'll catch that in the next one. Yeah. And it, it kind of became an important tenant for me, um, you know, by default. But I think there's a lot to be learned there. And, and, I, and I feel like we can help collapse the gap for some people to find their flow yeah. and their voice a lot faster. So I'd love for your thoughts on that. I think my reasoning is because I struggled a lot and you know better than anyone. So for those listening, like I am a recovering perfectionist <laughs> of to the nth degree, I'd say like, so. you know, immigrant child, a plus student, summa cum laude, like perfectionism was the only <laughs> route that I knew. So, but I knew that for the longest, I wanted to be an influencer for lack of a better term, a YouTube creator. And I, in your language, George, I pushed the starting line forward. Yep constantly yep. trying to sit there and plan what's the perfect video going to be like? What's the perfect lights that I have to have? What's the, what, what does the script need to look like? What do I need to wear? All of these different things and never actually creating. Yep. So now I feel like there's a responsibility. The reason why I don't archive is because there's a young Mo out there, a young George, a young Elizabeth, whatever, who's in that same state that I'm in. Yep. And they're going to go to the person they deem their favorite fucking creator and they're going to see the highlight reel now versus 10, 5, 6, 20 years ago. And I love the creators that don't archive because yeah. I can scroll and be like, dude, this dude was on a fucking webcam. Yeah. And now he runs a $3 million production. Like think of all your favorite creators. Like I'll just list two that are coming. MKBHD. Yep, he does a lot him. of tech stuff. And Mr. Beast, love him or hate him, whatever. You go back to their pages flip phones, Bro. webcams, and you see the progression. And then if you're studying it as a student consumer, not a passive consumer, you start to realize the little tweaks and you're getting those answers. So that's my number one reasoning. Number two, I'm going to use your language, you earn the right. Yes. The only way to be a scientist with content is to create content with, high, with a hypothesis. This will work because blah, and then do your best in making that creatively and then looking at how it performs. Mm -hmm. You cannot win in the content game without pressing publish. Yep. So it's a part of this whole thing. We have clients all the time where they're like, oh, but do we really have to post? It's like, yes, we have to post that because we're working on a green slate right now. Yep. It's very clear. I don't know what's working for the audience. I don't know what is. I, we're making a hypothesis about your personal brand, about what the audience needs, but I need to push that out there. 1000%. So I get the part of the messaging. So you can add this if you're taking notes. You make an arrow from the receiver to the messenger and you call that feedback. Feedback is when the audience debunks or cements your hypothesis. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, that's feedback. Yes. Your question should be, what could I change about this piece of content that I assume will make it work? When something does pop off, you study the hell out of it and then you repeat success. Yes. Over and over. So to get to any of that, you need to press publish because it's part of your exposure to the data. And to tie it to what you said earlier, the only way to see it as data is to not have it be done around a performance indicator because you know, I used to teach a lot of times for companies and for entrepreneurs that I was coaching, I was like when we say feedback, feedback is not just in the things that they do uh -huh. or the things that they say. It's also in the things that they don't sue and the things that they don't Big say facts. because we're also looking for patterns. We're looking for drop-offs. And I'm like, hey, if you've been posting seven days in a row and you're averaging you know, 100 likes and 17 comments and then you post again and you get none of them, it doesn't mean something broke. It just means something changed something was off and the only way to learn is to explore that but the only reason we know is because we posted it 100% and so i like to look at marketing and like you know i get paid an absorbent amount of money to teach people marketing <laughs> yeah. and here's what's funny marketing is just guessing and testing constantly and then once something works 
riding it like white lightning, know it's about to break, Facts. and having three guesses in the pipeline <laughs> to do it again. Well, let, let's like let's talk about, and I know this too well because I suffered. For, the reason why I teach this stuff now is because I suffered. Me too. Through not creating the only way to be able to objectively look at content. Yep. Regardless of the data, is another word for performance mindset is ego. Ego. Yep. Like you're fudging the data when you're only looking at good content versus bad content. For There's sure. There's a lot to learn from non performing videos. Yes. We've had videos that didn't perform in their original state. Actually, I can give a perfect example so people don't think we're. Just, you did this to one of my videos, by the way. Yeah. One of George's videos. We had a client where we produced a video. He was, it was talking head and he was just talking to the camera. There were good subtitles, little B roll, the title card, all the things that we put. And it did relatively well. Okay. Compared to everything else. And then I was like, no, I, I know this information will work. I've seen it on other creators. I know, like, I know this topic and his take on it is good. Something is off. And then we introduced, this video did relatively, this client was averaging anywhere between like 2,000 to uh, like 7,000 views. And this video in its first form did like 15,000. So I knew right there, okay, this is good relative to everything else. Then we were like, yo, let's repurpose it, which is a thing all creators do, by the way, in case you think people are just coming up with new ideas every single day. They are not. Sometimes they repurpose the actual video. And I was like, let's, do, let's change the edit. So we took him and put him in front of a green screen and made the B-roll flash behind him. Yeah. That video is now north of 2.5 million views. Mm. Nothing about that video changed. Nothing. Not the messaging, not the, I think the headline we even kept the same. I changed one variable and I was like, the pacing of this needs to change and be visually more appealing. Yep. And we did that and it, what, like 200 x mm -hmm. in numbers. So it's like, if I was just like, oh, I, I just want people to like him or performance mindset, all these kind of things, my ego would stop me from seeing the data that's in front of me. So I think that's a very powerful thing that gets a lot of people stuck in never creating or shitting on themselves when something is actually giving them good information. Yeah. And I think I'm going to open another loop that I don't talk about quite often, but I, I used to teach this concept around hero content, right? Mm. And hero content uh, for me and how I explained it to people uh, was your most popular viral, however you wanted to define it, content that your audience consistently responded to, whether you wanted it to be that or not. Mm. Right. And so, you know, I think what's important is like for, Civilized Caveman, right? I grew that to one of the biggest paleo food blogs in like under three years. I was getting some months north of 11 million people a month wow. on this paleo food blog. And everyone's like, okay, cool. And I was like, but nobody ever bothered to ask me where all my traffic came from. And it came from four recipes. And it wasn't by design. It was by catching it and then making it by design. So good. And so... And then here's what's crazy. It was some of the ugliest food photos and the simplest <laughs> recipes that I was like, this one, like, for example, my paleo banana bread was eight ingredients thrown into a blender, poured into a pan and in the oven. That banana bread was repinned on Pinterest 2.52 billion times that it got my wife and I flown up to Pinterest to sit down with the founders to <laughs> yes. ask what I was doing. Yes. But everyone's like, well, why did that happen? I was like, well, all I realized is when I posted it, that whenever I posted it and I emailed it out, that that recipe just got more traffic than everything else. And so I was just like, oh, I'll share this more. And I just kept sharing the recipe like once a month. And then every time I shared it, it Hashtag never went... Hashtag repurposed, yeah. by the way, for those listening. <laughs> and then I kept sharing it and it never went down. Nope. And so then I was like, oh, let me remake it, but let me take new food photos of it with different shots and different styling. Yeah. And then I'd share the same recipe and it would pop off. So then... I would change, I would keep the base recipe or add flavorings like honey cinnamon and chocolate chip swirl. But instead of updating the recipe, I would make it as a new recipe yes. and add the addition and <laughs> yes. then repost it for more traffic. Yes. And then I wanted to see how effective social media was. So I was like, I'm going to post the banana bread every day for 30 days on Facebook and I'm going to see if anybody complains. And nobody said anything because obviously understanding how algorithms work, not one person is going to see the same thing twice, right. but collectively added like, I think like 6 million extra clicks to my website. Yeah. And it was just riding that lightning, but it was only by being willing to recognize that I might've made the best recipe in the world. Yeah. But the success of my recipe wasn't that it was the best recipe in the world. It's that when I made it, that the recipe itself or the image itself was enticing enough that got yeah. other people excited enough about trying it. 
And so I could never take it personally nope. that it was my recipe or my food photo because there were a lot of things out of my control. And so it just kind of made me fall in love with the process. I'm like, oh, that one didn't work. I'll do it again. Oh, that one didn't work. I'll try it again. Yes. Oh. And like for us as a brand, up until two years ago, you never heard the word customer journey out of my mouth because I'd been talking about it for three years and nobody, everyone thought I was crazy. Mm. So it was email and email and email and email. And then about two years ago, email stopped working. Yes. And people started asking me questions about customer journey. Yep. So we rebranded everything from email to customer journey. I didn't change my offers. I didn't change the contents of the package. I had to change the wrapping paper mm. to match the language that everybody was speaking. So good. There's so much I want to unpack, but I want to give room to if you have a question. So because there's a lot, just like repeat everything he just said. And I want to just do like a deep dive analysis of it. Well, I, so I was going to ask you to do that because I, okay. I, I said I was going to open some loops for you because yeah. I knew it would lead to some important takeaways of yeah. lessons that I've learned. So, so consider that more of a, a, a layup or an alley-oop. The, fir the first part is you surrendering, to use your language, to the results that you got from the video after you published. Yeah. This to me is the definition of play. Yep. Right. Another coach of mine, he says, have strong beliefs held loosely. Mm -hmm. So let's paint the picture of the opposite direction that he could have taken with that. He could have looked at that banana bread picture and been like, oh, this photo is shitty. This recipe is not going to do much. If he was all ego, all performance, he'd be like, no, let me try something. Else. And then that thing would have never seen the light of day. Yep. And that, that particular recipe sounds like it completely transformed your business. Maybe a millionaire, yeah, bro. During that season. So he like, Okay, that also teaches you of like, what is palatable for the audience right now? They may not necessarily want the things that I love talking about. Yep. They just like the appetizer, but the appetizer brings them to my table. Yes. And then I can start having the deeper conversation, which is leading me down the rabbit hole that I know you want to take us because you set that up so beautifully. He said something here that is, I think, profound that you just said. That is the, like, the whole thing of my frameworks. He talked about how the banana bread was an introduction to him, right? So sometimes you need to ask yourself, I have great information. Oh, no, sorry. It wasn't the banana bread. I'm, I'm remembering now. He said he wouldn't use the word customer journey. Nope. There, that sounds small, but like, let's break this down because now I'm geeking out. The reason why he didn't use customer journey is that wasn't part of the colloquial tongue yet, right? He knew it. But he's also in the bottle, aka he's feeding himself customer journey rhetoric every day, all day. But if I were to go to my four-year-old son and say customer journey, he'd be like, dad, what are you talking about? So he used a term that was interchangeable with customer journey at the time. He used the word email. So what I want you to think about is if you are someone who's creating content right now and you have a zone of genius that you are just prolific in, you talk about it a lot, it's your bread and butter, it's what you know. It doesn't fucking matter if you say it in a way that only the same people in your ivory tower will hear. Yes. This is what we call in academia the ivory tower syndrome. Yep. A bunch of geniuses sitting in their fucking castle at the top talking about theorems and frameworks and experiments. and But like the general public yep. who would benefit greatly from this information if you were to just, for lack of a better term, dumb it down for yep. their understanding, can't hear you yet. So you have to set your ego aside and ask, what is something that I can connect my information to that will serve as a gateway for the average listener? That is the only question you should ask to go quote unquote viral. And there's, uh, George is pointing at me, but I'll share with you this. No, no, I want you to share. Okay. Then I'll point. So go ahead. No, no, you no, share. Go ahead. Okay. So whenever you're thinking about something that's related to your genius, try to frame it, stop and just ask yourself... In these three buckets, where does it fit? All human desire is based on what I call the wholeness three. So we have a desire, innate desire to feel whole. So they're consisting of three things. Psychology literature talks about this. Marketing literature talks about this. Number one is relationships. The relationship with yourself and the relationship with other. That is a fundamental human need. The second one is health. So physical, spiritual, mental, emotional health and the well-being of it. And the third one is freedom. And those, there's two components to freedom. Freedom of being, mm -hmm. I am autonomous. Freedom of finances, I am wealthy to be able to get mm -hmm. the things that I want. So whatever your punchline is in the video, whatever piece of information you want to give people, 
before you write the hook, ask yourself, how does this affect one of the three buckets? Which one is the most powerful? Mm -hmm. Let me share another example. So for him, he wanted to talk about customer journey. He was like, okay, well, email is the best way to frame that. Wonderful. What does email actually help somebody do? This is where knowing your audience is very important. So he's talking to six, seven figure, eight figure entrepreneurs. So let's just for easy math, let's just say it's the wealth bucket, the freedom bucket. This will help them make more money. Mm -hmm. So instead of him coming up and saying like, customer journey is the, the most impactful concept that you will ever need in business. I don't fucking care. Yep. That does not help me do the three other things. It's either achieve a reward, I call it the three A's, achieve a reward, avoid a pain, or activate a hormone. I'll get into that later. What he does instead is, what if one thing adds $125,000 to your monthly revenue? Mm -hmm. Now you're talking my language. Mm -hmm. I haven't told him what email is yet. I haven't even talked about customer journey. It doesn't fucking matter what the answer is, but they understand. Which I'm going to give you some evidence for the story. Yeah started with that and promoting it in the lens of um, exactly what you're talking about of uh, how using email would increase revenue. And then after starting that, realized that increased revenue was actually still too far of a movable middle. Yeah. And the movable middle I found that worked was showing them how I used my model to get 80% open rates at scale. There you go. Because that was something that they were like, when I get more open rates, I'll get more sales. Yep. And I knew that that was a symptom. <laughs> yeah. but, and they understood what open rate But meant. that symptom was one that was serving and causing a big pain point at the moment. Right. And we actually ran with that for, oh, I'd say a good two years where like that was the headline. Like I remember like yeah. how to get 82% open rates, 40% click-through rates and have your customers begging you for more email. That's it. And that one, that one stuck for like two years, but it was through starting how you said and then hitting that next one. 100%. 100%. And this, you are really dangerous when you understand that game. Yes. As a marketer, as an owner, as a CEO, as a freelancer, when you understand the, the, like the mind of the consumer mm -hmm. and break it down into uh, the wholeness, three relationships, health, and freedom, like you can turn anything viral. Yep. We have a recruiter that um, he works for... He's like the leading person to build teams for chiropractors. Got it. And I'm sitting there like when we're strategizing for our client, I'm like, how are we going to get this person in front of more people? Not many. The narrow audience is other chiropractors. Yeah. If I'm trying to go viral, I have to attach it to the general public. That is the, just the basis of going viral. General, naive, lay audience need to understand it. So I was like, what do people actually understand when it comes to recruitment? Well, they either want to know how to get a job. Mm-hmm. Or they want to make sure that they're working in a place that doesn't suck. Yeah. So one of the headlines, which did like 2 million views, it's like, how to know if you're going to work for a toxic company? And then in parentheses, from the interview alone. That's good. So like, that's long. You could tweak it. But like, I didn't say, here's the interview framework that will help. Like, none of that matters. Yeah. But what I'm helping them do is avoid a pain that they very much know especially if the main job force audience is millennials that are either leaving a job or a Gen Z that is going into a job. And they're like, last thing I want to do is work for a shitty boss. Yeah. Please tell me how to avoid that. Yeah. So I attacked immediately their health uh, wholeness. Yeah. Which is my mental well-being is more important than the dollars that I make. I want to work in a healthy environment. For sure. And they're like, yes, please give me the juice. For sure. So. Yeah, I, I love that. And, and I think too, two things I want to say. Number one is I think for everybody listening to this, you, you said like when you understand this, you get dangerous. Super and, dangerous. And, and dangerous, uh, what makes you dangerous or really effective is the <laughs> ethics, morals, and compass underneath them both. Mm -hmm. And so for everybody listening to this, I will say this will make you massively effective. But I, <laughs> I want you to understand as well that um, it's easy to get frustrated in this game as well. Yeah. Uh, because what, what you have to understand is that your gift is amazing, right? That's the thing that's inside the present. That's the thing that's inside the box. And whether your messaging or marketing works or doesn't work does not change the value of the gift. Amen. It just means the wrapping paper didn't get somebody to open it. And, and it's taken me a long time. And I mean like 10 plus years to truly understand that. But I like to equate things in stories and metaphors. And I think about my wife and my children and I and how 
my son is six, but I communicate with him very differently now at six than I did at three. Yes. And we've gone through these phases that have required that I change how I talk and I change how I listen and I change how I ask questions and I change how I give feedback. And it helps me when I think about my messaging in that same lens to like what I'm doing is laying out a path and a journey for people to follow just like I would my son. And, mm-hmm. and it helps me a ton because it is, it is sometimes, and, and I want to be real with people like, no matter how long I've done this, <laughs> no matter how much fucking success I've had, <laughs> No matter how many millions, hundreds, millions, billions of dollars I've generated, yep. I still feel like putting my forehead through the wall <laughs> Sometimes when I have worked through everything and I'm like, this is fucking perfect. Like, yep. yeah, boom. And then I swing and miss 73 times and then some silly person throws something out and it works like crazy. And I'm like, really? And then I have to remind myself the cosmic joke. And so, so good. I just say this for everybody to recognize that like, this is also the gift of the game. And I think where uh, the most effective companies, the ones that win the most effective entrepreneurs are the ones that understand that we might not like this part and the rules, but our willingness to explore it and our willingness to play with it is really what gives us the competitive advantage. Cause you're just saying, I'm, we, I'm, re-willing to wrap my present faster than you and more creatively than you to get more experience and more at-bats to start understanding the things that work every time to give myself more confidence to be able to do this and just keep swinging at it. Let me, I want to add this. I love talking to you. I feel like this is going to be the first of many because it's just, it's oozing. Again, he said something very profound that I just immediately put into the communication lens where he said he had to learn to change how he speaks, learn how to change how he listens. Now, notice that is from a place of complete humility and wanting results over being right. But where I want to tie this into is a message without a messenger or receiver is nothing. Yes. Like, I would say that again because I come from, you know, where people are like, say it again. The <laughs> message without a messenger or receiver is nothing. Because it's through that feedback and through the effectiveness of delivering it that the message becomes palatable and then becomes discussed. Yes. So had he not wrapped the philosophies he teaches his son, wrapped the philosophies he teaches his clients, whatever. And by the way, George is you, you are George, I am George, like all these kind of things. Then your genius would have never been actually heard. Yep. And that's why I would always trump being right over, over getting a result. Because yeah. your goal is you want you probably want more clients. You yeah. probably want more notoriety for your business. Yep. The only way to do that is to, I call it candy before medicine. Wrap it as a piece of candy. That's why you have gummy Tums. No one wants to taste fucking digestive medicine. So it tastes palatable. So then they can ultimately get the result from the genius that you have. So humble yourself. Well, and, and I think one of the things that I realized is that it's only genius until it's understood and actualized on the other side. Yeah. And there was a lot of times that I was more worried about what it looked like rather than the effectiveness of getting somebody there or even getting myself there. And, you know, I think that that, yeah, it was, it was a valuable, valuable lesson. To I learn. think it's a career changing because like for me, it comes from the place, like I was the 20 word, $20 word guy. Yeah. In my friend group, like I had friends being like, wow, that's a moism. And then I was really proud of that. Oh, me too. I'm still very proud of that. But I realized the more I did ego work, like, am I just like talking for the sake of coming across super smart or is the other person actually understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, do I have to use the word X versus this other word that would just be significantly more palatable and then they feel smarter, they understand it better and I am just getting them to a result. And when that clicked after like yeah, multiple years of academia and entrepreneurship, I'm like, that's the game. You'll laugh at this one. That's the fucking game. I was in a meeting in Austin, Texas, like three <laughs> weeks ago to close a very large, very large deal. <laughs> yeah. And I was the only one in the office at the closing round. Oh, God. And so we're having this conversation. You'll just appreciate this because this would also answer how I hold myself accountable to what you just talked about. Yeah. And we were talking They asked my philosophy on this thing. And, and, and mind you, this company does... Two billion a year in revenue in the sports world. Yeah. Um, 
and I said something and I was answering and I'm sitting with like these three like C-suite executives, like Oxford educations, yeah. right? I'm in my hoodie. I got my feet up on the chair. <laughs> yes. I'm literally like this yes. and I'm talking and then I'm just answering this thing. And then I used a word that I didn't even know what it meant. And then I was like, wait, hold on. Stop. Do any of you know what that word I said just mean? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, what's it mean? And they answered it. And I was like, did I use it right? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, awesome. I didn't know what I mean. I didn't mean to use it. Sorry. Bad habit. Old, old habits die yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah. And they just died laughing at me. So true. And then we joked about it and they asked why. And I was like, well, I used to think if I just remembered these big words that it made me feel smart. And I realized that it just made me look dumb. And then my wife told me one time's enough that I remembered and started to catch it. Yeah. And I just don't ever want to come across like that anymore. So I just rather hold myself accountable. They're like, we can't believe you stopped us to ask us if the word that you used was yeah. used right. And what the definite, I was like, yeah, sorry. I just thought you'd find that funny. Yeah, no, that's so good. And if you can, that is, think of the m- most memorable speeches or performers that you've watched. Oh yeah. Like it's not this super canned performance. It's blocked. For blocking sure. like in theater where you know your position where you're going that's what blocking means but like there's a lot of in real time yeah. things happening yeah. that you end up falling in love with yeah. that had you can the whole thing or tried to come across something different than what you are yeah it would have not worked so that moment i don't know you i'm sure you close that deal but like that moment was probably like wow he's humble enough to admit and a, a, a moment where he's feeling like he needs to be something he's not he said it out loud therefore in conversations, in leadership position, he's going to have a very empathetic dialogue. And there's all these things that are connecting just from a very moment, like true moment of authenticity and do I know it's that fun. we forget well, that I know the it's audience funny. relates to. My only thing in my brain is this is the integrity that keeps me in sobriety. Got to be. That's it. Because it's my authentic expression, yeah. which is like, no, 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 no. I'm integrity. I have no problem laughing at myself. I stop keynotes now. I don't care. Yeah. It's just so funny that my truth creates the most ultimate rewards the more i protect it every time because you don't my my another (laughs) another a coach of mine he says when you're saying the truth you don't have to think too hard nope because it just comes out like if you ask me my name mo yeah is that short for something muhammad yeah i'm quick but like ask somebody lying this is i know we're talking about video but like do you ever watch a video and you're like something's just not kosher about this video i talk about it all the time i tell people that like when (laughs) when you fucking call me (laughs) and you're in a meltdown and you're about to lose your company and then you come to my office and you spend three days with me in payment of zoom amount of money and then it works and it doubles your business and you ask me for a year what i did and i tell you the same fucking thing is that all i did was align your truth so it came across authentic and everything else worked and then they all are like oh my god i see it now Oh my God, I see it now because you can sense that. You can feel that from a mile away. Yes. And this authentic expression, this thing of like not having to carry the weight and remember the story and knowing your message and just being yourself and being nuanced and allowing your personality and allowing the nuance of your personality and these expressions of self and these quirks. Like what you don't understand is that everybody who begs me for strategies and tactics refuse to utilize the ones that are free (laughs) and the most effective that will blow any other one out of the water that create the ultimate core that's required for any emotional based decision, which is all opting in and all paying, which is safety because it humanizes you. 100%. Because if you watch a video and it does not feel in alignment, you can tell that the speaker is being incongruent with who they are. It's like the, uh, what's it called in AI? The Uncanny Valley? Is that what it's called? Yeah. yeah. When you're watching somebody and you're like, wait, is this a robot? Because their eyes come across like it doesn't have a soul. Yes. That is the feeling we get as an audience member when we're just like, something is not right here. Yep. And usually the conclusion is, this person's trying too hard. This feels too manicured. Yep. Like, and we're seeing that with tests, like the higher fidelity of the footage or production yep. on social immediately triggers us into pattern recognition of ads. Yep. And we're like, I don't want to watch an ad. So you have to play this line. I know where you're like, I thought this guy was going to teach me how a video, but I promise you, I well, can teach are. you camera. I can tell you all that stuff, but the how will ne- you'll never get there if you don't just cement yourself in the notion that, there's an audience out there that has no idea who you are. 
And the only way for them to get closer to you is twofold. You have to speak in a way that they can understand and you have to do it in a way that's yourself. 1000%. That's the game. That is it. Everything else will be optimized with the reps. Yes. Every single time. And to give more weight to something I talk about on this podcast all the time, why does the authenticity matter? Because the true secret of marketing at scale is understanding that no journey is linear, Mm. which means that people are in a journey in an ecosystem of unfamiliar, unpredictable touch points, completely out of your control. And the only way that marketing is effective at scale, understanding that we don't have control of those touch points is that if consistency and congruency is the core of everything that you do. So when these touch points are collected and they hear you on this other podcast and somebody tells them a story about you and says, this is what they did when they DM'd me. And they're like, oh my God, that's what he said when I asked him a question after my keynote. Oh, and he said that on a video inside of his course. The ability of that to be a weapon for your benefit comes down to your ability to be consistent and congruent, both in your messaging and in your actions and in your words and your behaviors, embodying that same principle and those same things into your team so that that authenticity is the message that's consistent and congruent. And it's the actual only way to ensure that when they go from Twitter to Instagram or Instagram into your ecosystem or into your brick and mortar or meet you at an event, that that experience becomes one that creates more endowment and loyalty regardless of the transaction, which is what creates movements Mm -hmm. and scales businesses because that's where it's built on the back end. That's it. And video is just one of many touch points that you have with these uh, super fans, if they become super fans, customers, audiences, people that just get your stuff for free, whatever it may be. It's just a medium into that. And the biggest compliment that I've ever received once the video content took off for my business was on a sales call where I did not know this person from Adam. We did not write in the DMs before the sales call. And I'm the one who took the sales call. First thing out of their mouth was like, you're exactly like you are in your videos. Mm -hmm. And my ego flared up. I was like, oh, thanks. Appreciate that. I, I love that compliment. But the other, the curious side of me was like, hmm, that tells me a lot about the market, meaning a lot of people are out here fronting. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Right? So like if you're fronting on video, then you get on a sales call and the experience is different or like you wear a suit in your videos, but you're (laughs) out in public and like khakis and a shirt. Like these are actual conversations I've had with clients to break through the mindset. He's like, should I wear a suit? Should I wear I'm like, what do you wear when you're taking a prospect out to lunch? What do you wear day to day? And as soon as you ask them that question, again, it's who they are. It's their truth. They don't have to think too hard. Nope. Because they're trying to appease versus just be. So as soon as you break that, things become a lot easier. And you want that level of congruency across all touch points of your business. I feel like I'm having to improve myself even in those areas. But these are the these are like the beautiful questions that we get to ask whenever we're experimenting publicly. For sure. And this is what I tell people when I say like, hey, you got to understand that 86% of marketing is word of mouth. And Everybody only thinks about the experience of typically people that pay them, but you just alluded to something so powerful that I make people think about is that what you have to think about is when you represent yourself one way in an ad or one way in a piece of content, and then they get on a sales call and they have an inconsistent experience, what you think about is, oh, I didn't land the deal and you move on to the next close. What you fail to think about is that every person who asked that person about you from this point forward is only going to talk about how you were incongruent and it didn't match and that they shouldn't work with you. And when you lose sight on that and when you lose focus on that, it ends up sometimes creating so much collateral damage that the image of the brand cannot be recovered. And I've personally helped multiple companies through this Mm -hmm. and having to like completely start over. And I just think, you know, when I talk about the lens of this podcast, like, why relationships matter and relationships beating our limbs. And I've been really bullish even the last couple of months of saying over and over that if all you're trying to do is monetize dollars, you're missing the most important currency because dollars come as a byproduct of relationship, but relationship is the capital that literally trumps them all. Facts. And so this, this, this whole thing like this is, and, and you said this a minute ago, but I want to call attention to this. This is actually how to win with video. Mm-hmm. Because when this part is nailed, the production doesn't matter. The lighting doesn't matter. No. None of it matters. And and I say that because I I I was blessed to learn that way. And like I could look at some of those live videos, bro. And like 
I had the first live stream multi-camera cooking show. Yeah. I did the first underwater Facebook Live ever. Nice. We did it 100 feet. Nice. We built cables for days so to figure good. this out. <laughs> so good. And like I have these and, and they're hilarious. But I even remember earlier and I want to close this loop and talk about some like tangible hows yeah, to, yeah. to kind of land this plan since we'll end up doing another how one and, you <laughs> Probably know, more than so, that. Yeah. Um, but even earlier when I alluded to and I'd love your thoughts on this and how like a big fear that entrepreneurs have like I don't want to be on video or I won't remember my lines or how do I do it right? Or I can't memorize those and all those things. And I'll never forget. I had this one client and was so stuck on like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I was like, I'm going to make a rule with you. I'm going to actually not let you look at the camera. And all I want you to do is read your lines from this paper Yeah, in front of the camera. So she was like literally camera here looking to the side. And I said, but all of them have to start the same way. I'd be like, you have to be honest, be like, Hey, I'm extremely nervous to talk to you facing the camera and I'm yeah. afraid I'm going to forget my lines, but I'm an incredible naturopath and I'm way better at a doctor than I am on being on video. So I'm doing this so you can actually hear what I have to say. Yeah. And she recorded videos, bro. And her business went through the roof Yeah. and it was just her. Like it was just like her authentic expression. And yeah. I like think about that. So like, what are some of the creative ways you've seen people express messages or share messages on video without having to necessarily be the one? Yeah. My favorite one that I tell a lot of clients who are especially DIY, like they're doing it for themselves is first and foremost, talking to a camera is fucking weird. Yes. If, if you haven't done it, it's weird. It, because it is. We're naturally like we, we're, we, we lean towards getting a reaction. Me and yes. George are talking about this a lot, which is probably why you're falling in love with this episode because me and him are just jamming and you're hearing him as well because we're feeding off of each other. You don't have that with the camera. Nope. So an easy way to bypass this is if you have a trusted confidant yep. or friend or even colleague in your business, or you can assign this to your assistant or videographer or whatever, you just get um, on video, whether that's on a Zoom call or in front of the camera, but you talk to them. Yes. You talk to them. Now, regardless of whether you do that with do that or do a script, what I want you to do is outline your thinking. One of the things that I always talk about is you want to be able to help the audience go from the starting point to the end in a way that's followable. So some people need a word for word script. Yep. If you're super early in the process and you're trying to build that muscle, go word for word, get you a teleprompter, get over this feeling that you don't come across natural because what you're trying to fix right now is your mouth and mind synchronization. Yep. That's all you're worried about yep. right now. So do the teleprompter thing. That's fine. But let's say you're a little bit more advanced and you know the stuff in and out and you're just not comfortable with being authentic on camera. 1000%. Having that person on the sideline with your outline. So an outline can just look like a main point, which is the big idea and then one to two sub points underneath it. And you want to limit it to just three big main points organizationally. So for example, let's say back to the caloric deficit example. It's like, I need to teach them about that activity is not the only thing that makes them lose weight, what calories are, and then how to best do it, right? That's what I'm writing on the outline. That's it. That's it. And then I have that person off camera framing that outline as a conversation. Yep. So they're looking at that outline. And they're saying, okay, well, what's up with this myth that everyone thinks they need to work out seven days a week? And then you just go. Yep. You just say, well, the reason why X, Y, Z, but, and you should know this if you're a pro and you yep. know your stuff, yep. right? And maybe you've done a little bit of research before filming so you know what to hint, like to hit at, that there's practice there, and then you just keep going. Now, the video is just you talking to someone and the camera just happens to be facing you at yep. the same time. Yep. That is probably the one of the easiest tricks. The other one is to stick a sticky note if you don't have a teleprompter on the top of the lens yep. with that outline. Yep. Then you look at it. Right. Okay. Familiarize yourself. This is where I'm going to go. Cool. Look at the camera. Take a breath. Start. Do it in a small take. This could be one minute. Then go back to the sticky note. Okay. This is where I'm going next. Pause. Do it. And then in post production, you just cut out the dead space. Yep. I think the, the easy answer to this is like all the videos you see that look like they're one takes, they're probably not. Never. Unless this per, and if they are one take, Go back to the person's catalog. This is video number 330,000. That, that's me. That's me. Like gift of gab, yeah. not even, but a trained gift of gab. Yeah, that, that's me. But in reality, there's a lot of post-production that's happening where this editing is happening, dead space, B-roll, and it's not this perfect linear sentence. No. Ever. So those no. are two of the easiest yeah, ways. And I, and I think too, to give some other creative ideas too, is just thinking about, right, like video is uh, hands down, and, and this was 2020, 
I think uh, Google had done a stat and they predicted by 2022 over 80% of all content consumed would be video and it ended up breaking that already. So it COVID amplified that whole process with consumption. Yeah. And so understand that that video is a medium that everybody is choosing right now yes. to be the the modality that they consume the most. And short form content tends to be the one that yes. leans over everything because it allows people to seek out lots of information or lots of curiosities with very minimal investment required 100%. to get their fix or direction to move in that direction. And so with that, I, I think for everybody, talking on camera is one way. Using text on video is another way. Uh, I love people like the Stephen Meller who can draw. Yeah, yeah. And he actually just draws his content yeah. on, the, on the paper. I love the people that... Um, have important things to say and then record them and then just put the voice over B-roll. Yes. Right. I think what's important is that if you have a message that you want to share and you understand the importance of video, which, which I think we are both amplifying that importance for you to understand this, mm -hmm. that you might not be comfortable doing talking head videos and you might not be comfortable doing, you know, uh, interviews just like I wouldn't be comfortable drawing. And so it's not about... Right doing all of them, it's about, okay, if I want to really spread this message and I'm being honest with myself that I really do want to spread this and I'm willing to spread this and I know this will help my business or help my life or help my voice or whatever that is, yeah. then what's the way that I'm the most comfortable where I can still get the message across, but it also matches me to allow me to lean into this more and do it. And I think that that's the most important part. And, and I think the more you it is, you know, the better it is. And you know, that's the thing that you can't be taught. The science to this is have a message, know who you're speaking to, use video as that modality. But I think the more creative you can be in the expression matching you, whether that's, I mean, I've, I've seen so many people do this, like personas are built because they're like, I wasn't comfortable being on camera, but I wanted to do it. So I put a mask on right. and then everybody loved the mask. And so now I have a mask on for the next, you know, so three years. And so you see these people that, you know, put get up on and now they end up wearing that one set of makeup for every yep. single video yep. or the people uh, like me and what I leveraged and became familiar was, um, was actually unscripting everything with no content and only going live yeah and that for a while but now it's funny because now i record videos my outfits are all the same but it's <laughs> it's almost like when i put that outfit on i'm you're ready getting into video yeah, mode you're ready and so i think what's important is just practicing that and finding that way to express and even creating some of these new modalities because it, it, it wasn't even like four months ago where another cycle came around where people started putting the inspirational quotes that were going viral on Instagram again. Yes. And then putting them on moving backgrounds to go hit reels. Yes. Right. And that's because someone's like, Hey, I'm really sick of making memes right now, or I want to try this. And, and I think the more you're willing to play with it and just be committed to the playing of it and figuring out how it works, I think the better you're going to be. But I wanted to share some of those thoughts too. hundred percent. I, I just want to add to what you said, even if you find yourself using a different, version of video like let's say it's populating text let's say it's yeah. animations or mogra i still want you to put the camera on yourself mm. with for the talking head piece even if you're not going to publish it and here's why i say this for years i taught public speaking video just happens to be my medium now yep. from the marketing perspective yeah but if you are really d devoted to your genius yep and you want to spread that message you're going to make content let's say I don't want to use the word hiding, but let's say you're still not fully there yet to put yourself in front of the camera talking head. Content is going to expand your notoriety. Yep. And at some point, this is inevitable. And th this is the burden of being a pro, right? Someone's going to ask you to speak. Yes. <laughs> and by the way, I say speaking and you probably think keynote speech on a stage, thousands of people, big pause here. They may just ask you to do a internal training with their team. Yep. Or Three interview. people on Zoom. Or, yeah. Simple interview. You're going to have to develop that muscle yep. of communicating. Yep. And the more reps you do with the video in the background, right? The more you can watch yourself. Yep. And study. What am I like silently? What am I like audibly? What am I like visually? And when you do it from a place where there's not this performance ego mindset going on, you're allowed to tell yourself, well, I don't like how I'm 
crunched over all the time. That doesn't make me in my most power, right? Or I see that I have this filler word that I constantly say, I don't like how I come across that way. Let me change that. And then you find yourself on stage and it's like you've had years of public speaking yep. training. Yep. So even if you're doing the animation, even if you're drawing, have a camera on the side pointing at you, watching the struggle, watching the growth. So when you, when you watch it again to study yourself, you're like, oh, I do that. I have this yep. natural tick. And it's just, it just becomes this diary that you can study and evolve from. Yeah. I, I love that. I think, I think for me, and, and I'm, I'm going to be transparent about this. I've, I've always actually struggled to watch my content mm -hmm. and to watch my speeches and to watch and even listen to my podcasts. And I've reflected on this for years and I used to say, oh, it's because I don't like my voice or whatever. That's not true. That's none of that. Um, I fell in love with kind of creative expression as being my medium mm -hmm. to paint the world. And what would happen is I would find myself when I would listen and I would listen to the ones that did really well, I would start picking things up and almost agendizing them and trying to make them a part of my playbook. Mm. And it made them ineffective because they only worked in the moment because the context in that moment yeah. was because I was off the spot and off the cuff. Mm. And I started finding myself trying to like write my sets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, in writing my sets it kind of turned off yeah. the part that made it good. But that's also the part that scares me the most of like knowing like I walk into an audience of a thousand and I have no fucking plan. Right. And now that's my, my new drug. Like that's what I love, which is why I love speaking and I love doing it. Yeah. But it is really, really interesting. But one of the things that I did was when I realized like I couldn't really watch them anymore. Yeah. But I also knew that most of the time speaking, I would catch myself when I said something like I shouldn't say, or yeah. I knew that I could recover from the fumble and have nobody catch it, but then I would be thinking about the fumble. Yeah. And my talk would still be good, but it wouldn't be effective. They'd think it was great, but I'd kind of know I was like giving yeah. a rehearsal speech. And so then that's when I read the book Radical Honesty. And I was like, I'm just going to hold myself accountable to these moments of like, if I say something, I'm going to stop the keynote. I'm going to stop yeah. the meeting. And it's funny because the first couple of times I did it, it was like the most exhilarating thing ever. Uh, but then every time I did it, there was some like hidden benefit I never even saw possible. <laughs> and then I was like, God, so this is like the best secret. So and so, good. but but when I started content, it was also my past to stay in production, like to stay in momentum because like, I would fuck up live videos and I'd be like, wait, I'll be right back. I need my other camera. It's in the other house. Hold on. Yeah. And I would just leave the camera running oh, you just in, go do an it. hour and a half in the middle of a live stream in my kitchen. And then the nanny's screaming, Branson's running around. I'd be out in the garage looking for something. I come back like, sorry. Right. And then that led me to the confidence when I was giving a keynote once like 500 people. I was so nervous. I forgot to pee. And about halfway through, I was like, <laughs> I'm going to piss my pants. <laughs> And so I looked at in the audience, I'm like, now I'm going to give you an exercise and I'm going to be really transparent. I do breathing in my keynotes a lot. You're only doing this because I'm going to go pee while you breathe. Yeah. And so here's the cadence, go. <laughs> and then I ran so out and good. peed and came back. And it's like, it's funny what I, what I, I think the reason I'm sharing it and I'm sure you have quirks as well is I think what's so important for everybody is to like find your truth that helps kind of get you back. Oh, for sure. To like your expression or your momentum or like kind of your medium, like knowing that like, you know, as a food blogger making videos, I was going to mess up recipes and I hated editing more than I hated owning my mistake. Yes. And so I'd be like, well, guess what? I would show you what this was going to look like, except I fucking destroyed it. Yeah. And I promise you, if you follow the recipe, yours won't do this. But because I was talking to you, I missed this. Yeah. And then it became just like the fun way, but also safe to be work. And so I think for everybody is like... hundred. Just understand that like the more you practice, the more you play, the more you look, the more you audit, the more you reflect from this lens of like, God, I'm a tool. Yeah. And the more I use this tool and read the owner's manual of this tool and then sharpen this tool and adjust where I use this tool. So good. The more effective I am. But you kind of got to fall in love with the fact that like you really have to play with the tool. You have you have to. And what like some of you, I don't know if you 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 listen to the podcast, but Maybe some of you have never seen George in real life, but he he's a master communicator. Thank he's you. a master communicator. He knows how to run the room. He knows how to manage energy. So there's many layers to this, which are why I feel like this is episode one of many. But notice how even in the light of not wanting to watch himself, 
he did, or he audited himself and then asked the question like, how can I manipulate this or leverage this in a way that feels authentic? So he can pull off the stopping in the moment on stage, but he figured that out from studying the tape. Yeah. And he identified it with his values. He's like, I'd rather be authentic. I'm not about to edit because (laughs) I don't want to do all that. So here's the best solution for me to express that in that way. Yeah. I actually personally, there's a lot of actors that will tell you, I don't watch myself after the movie. I know the reason why, because in the movie, an actor needs to get into the scene. There's a lot of things that are happening. And if they watch it out of the scene, then they're watching it from too much of a logical brain. And there's a lot of I have a takeaway for this too that I'll share after. Please do. Oh God, this got me excited. Please do. At the same time though, I disagree with that statement when you are somebody in training. Yes. I disagree with that statement fundamentally because they know not to watch themselves because it puts them in a state of overthinking and then not being present in the scene and letting go of self-awareness. Yep. And the, or sorry, self-consciousness and then being present to the scene. There's reason behind that. But when you're just starting out, I implore you to watch yourself. For sure. Implore you, but do it from the lens of a student consumer. And I say this all the time, not the model. Have you, if you've ever been a ph- photographer of somebody and you take a picture of them, the last thing you want to do is show them the picture as soon as you took it. Yes. Because they are breaking the, the photo down from how do I look versus how does the photo look? Yep. And you're looking at, you talk about this all the time. We're talking two different languages. You're looking at it as like, is the framing good? Is all this. So when you watch yourself, This is going to be the hardest task, but it's the most rewarding. Yeah. You watch yourself as if you were the audience. Yep. You watch yourself as somebody who is critiquing a student outside of their, outside of them being the student. So I watch myself all the time. Like you talk too fast there. Yep. Because I value the understanding of the audience. So for me, that's my filter too fast. Your energy took, took too, took too much control of you. It didn't drive the message home. There wasn't enough inflection here. So next time I'm like, okay, slow down. Mm Mm-hmm right? Or I don't like this filler word that I say. It takes away anything that takes away from the meaning of the video and the meaning of your authenticity. It's fine to get rid of it. Or you say like, yo, that part right there, it could, when you're in that student mode, you could watch something and be like, I didn't even think I was doing that, but I love that for the message. Yes. And then you're like, I'm doubling down on that. So are you recreating success when you're on stage, when you're on the video? Yeah. But you're studying the film too. For sure. So important. The way that I break this down is I think that you have to be intentional about two specific modes. Mode number one is performance mode. Mm-hmm. And mode number two is reflection mode. Yep. Right. And like, it doesn't do you any good to be in the fourth down of a Super Bowl and down by seven points <laughs> no. and looking at your playbook and analyzing the plays. At that point, you right. have to call the plays that you have. That is not the time to reflect. Yes then there is the time to reflect. Yeah. And in that time to reflect, you have to reflect with intention. Like you have to have a goal that you're trying to achieve. And for all you entrepreneurs, I'm just going to say this now. And you can say, oh, dad, I can't believe you're saying that. It is not looking through the lens of how you didn't say it right or how you fucked it up or how you can't believe you said that or how you missed that. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, I said all these things. This worked. Okay, what can be improved to help the message, 100%. to help it land, to help it achieve and like, and and I love that you're calling this out, Mo, because I, I feel like at the end of the day, like communication is like single-handedly one of the greatest weapons that you can have in your arsenal. 100%. And it's one that has to be practiced. But even now, like to this day, like I'll be running an event, right? And on the afternoon of day one, I'll be cheeky and sarcastic and I'll say something that I think is funny and the audience will laugh. But then somebody be like, will come up to me on a break and they'll be like, hey, when you said that, I know everybody thought it was funny, but it kind of hurt my feelings a little bit. And I will completely apologize. And then when we come back for break, I will actually clean it up with the room. Yeah. And there's been times where I've done that. And then on day two, I accidentally like referenced it as a joke. And then I'm like, wait, 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 I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to say that. Right. And it's just practicing it over and over. And, and I think what really, you know, ticks down for me, and I think you talked about this is understanding that like, at the core, like ultimately I don't necessarily, and this goes back to earlier, I do care what people think, but I, I don't care about what they think about me. I, I care more about them having a positive experience Mm -hmm. with me. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that like they agree with my personality or that my beliefs, but that our interaction is positive. Yeah. 
And so when you said that earlier, I was like, oh, no, no, I, I don't care what they think about me personally. I think I care that regardless of what they think about me, mm-hmm. that they have this like positive interaction. Yeah. And I think about that a lot too, because I, I feel like for years I struggled with like, oh my God, the algorithm this, or this competitor is doing this. And, and, it, and it even made me kind of lose focus on the fact that there were still people reading that. Yeah. There were still people watching oh, yeah. that, right? And and I think too, the reason I say this is in this lens of reflection and looking at the audit, recognizing that if you look at it through the lens of evidence of like what you're not doing and what you're doing incorrectly, it will get in the way of your consistency, which is actually already breeding the results that you want. Yeah. It's creating touch points for people. It's showing your growth in humanity. It's allowing you to document a journey and people to witness it with you. It's allowing them to take it with you. And so I, I think... My summary for this and like understanding video as a tool is that the more you practice it, the more effective it will be. It is here to stay. 100%. And so if it is something that you want to explore, if it is something that you're using, if you do realize that you're going to be in business in three years and in five years and like this is it until AI and, you know, augmented reality and all (laughs) that's here, like video is going to be the communication modality until we get into that next evolution then you find the way to start playing it and, and recognize that the more at-bats you take and the more you try and the more things you put out there and the more you audit it and you make the adjustments, the more you will win. And, and we see people all the time, I want to be like Mr. Beast. I want to be like, you know, the now boys. Mm-hmm. I want to be like so-and-so. And like, I have the gift of knowing some of those guys. And when you recognize that for eight years, they worked 22 hours a day all they did. studying, studying, studying. They were doing exactly what you're sharing and they just increased the amount of volume to speed up the lessons because they invested that time in the right area right. to audit. And so it's a, it's a really important thing. 100%. I couldn't have said it better. Couldn't have said it better. Yeah. I think we should land this Let's one. land it. Let's land it. Let's land it. Okay. First. Okay. So you do a lot of good in the world um, <laughs> and you. I am very supportive of your good. Um but there's a few places in the world where people can find you. Yes. And so let's paint that picture for them so they can get into the world of uh, the Egyptian Drake over here. <laughs> the Egyptian Drizzy. The, uh, the, sand, the sand skier. You can say it. I can't <laughs> say it. And by the way, in the intro, it took an hour and 56 minutes to close that loop. But that's the oh, loop I, where I said the no, skier of the medium that I can't say. <laughs> I know. I was like, we'll get to that one later. Yeah. So uh, the company, <laughs> the company's name is uh, Mox. So M O C S. It is not Mox Media, but the only URL because dot com was taken was dot media. So it's www.mox.media. M O C S dot media. We are not Mox Media. We are Mox uh, dot media. So that's the website. And then Instagram is where I'm most active. Yeah. Moisma, M-O-I-S-M-A-I. Uh, don't hesitate to hit me in the DMs if you have a question. Um, and my uh, objective, especially after this trip to Montana, is uh, the the content going to be pumping out yeah. like crazy uh, as I adjust my own capacity and bandwidth, which is something we didn't get to. But uh, that's where you can find me. And I'm just excited. I- I'll leave you with this. Um, if you haven't published a video at all, or if you're on your 50th video, like the content that you produce, you will find yourself as you produce it. That a lot, if you're anything like me, you wanted it perfect day one. I can't stress enough how your messaging, your marketing, your content, and its effectiveness will literally be birthed through the application of it over time, because then you can start telling yourself what you want and what you don't want out of it. So please just commit to the practice of doing your best to create the content. Even if you don't publish it, maybe you're not there yet. Maybe the anxiety is too high. Just produce it, watch it until you're ready to press publish. And that could start as small as on your story for 24 hours. Yep. Or you can put it into your feed or you can put it on YouTube and just know you can always delete it. If it really, but uh, no, if you really no. hate it, I wouldn't experiment no. it publicly. So your 10 year old self, which by the way, if you delete it, the algorithm hates it. And it puts a red mark on it. <laughs> so stop. And yeah. that's, that's factual. Do not do it. It, it absolutely hates it. And then you're going to be like, my content's not going anywhere. No one's seeing it. I'm like, well, because for the one video you posted, you deleted 49 of them. <laughs> yeah. So Instagram does not like that. Neither does TikTok. Neither does YouTube. Um, you will find your voice when you actually speak. For sure. Just do that. And and listen, find yourself the permission slip, right? Protect the progress. Whether 
You've recorded your first video, whether you've never done it, pick something, ideate, think about three things. 100%. If you've done 60 and you realize that you've been doing them unintentionally, how can you add some intention? Yeah. Give some wrapping paper. If you've got a ton, but you've never audited them and you're like, God, I feel like I'm missing the cheat codes here. Go give it an audit. Yeah. Right. And like, ask yourself, look through them like, wow, when I did those three on that topic, look how my audience responded. Yep. When I did those ones, they didn't, but they said it was an important topic. Well... If the topic's important and they didn't respond to that one, maybe I should ask them how I should talk about it yeah. or what would have made them respond, right? And I, and I think for me, as a takeaway for a lot of this, a lot of what we talked about is an undertone and I think is a guiding principle to speed up the process is when you're reflecting, reflecting back and asking through the lens of your audience. But also one thing I forgot to say is also uh, don't ever forget to ask your audience. That's a fact. Use them. That's a fact. That's part of ideation, by the way. We talk to our audience all the time, daily. Instagram DMs, Slack messages. We jump on Zoom calls. We send video messages back and forth. And at any opportunity I can, my last interaction is always a question. Yes. <laughs> like, well, what about this? Is there anything that I missed? Is there anything we haven't covered that you're missing? Uh, you've been listening to the podcast or any topic I haven't hit. Yeah. Right. And we just ask constantly. And the more you have a relationship yes. with that data, and allowing it to come in, the faster you're really going to put the pieces together and figure out the order of those ingredients to make that dish. Big facts. And, and I think too, like to summarize this down to cooking, right? Like just because you have the right ingredients doesn't mean that it's always going to turn out the same. Facts. The ingredients might be perfect, but it would have been the order or the time it baked or the amount of time you spent on the hook versus the content versus the thing. And so don't discredit the quality of your ingredients because the process or the order might not have been right. Facts, facts. And so just make sure you're seeing it for what it is. And I feel like we've probably given people a lot of takeaways for this one. I hope so. Yeah. I think if we, I think it. when we do part two, <laughs> uh, we have to do it in person. Yeah. Uh, but secondly, I'm sure we should, I feel like at this point, everybody's earned the right for some gifts of how. Yeah, sure. we could probably give some gifts of how. Yeah, I'm thinking frameworks for short form content. Yeah, I'm thinking you know how to do the damn thing. I'll give you something that I haven't shared publicly with anybody except my team. And you've earned this since you're two hours. If in. you're two hours in, you 100 percent deserve this, and there will probably be a product around this at some point mm -hmm. in the year. But the biggest thing that people struggle with, and this is from my con community telling me, is writing the hook. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you the framework that. And we just like, I literally just finalized and it's after writing a thousand plus hooks, after studying hooks, everyone wants to give you like verbatim what to say. I feel like that's making you codependent on me. So this particular framework is modular. Um, I don't really care how you write the things, adjectives and nouns and pronouns. That's just to make it sexier. And there are different linguistic things that you can do, but just remember this, it's called the pods framework, P O D S. Okay. Your goal is to stitch together one of those four letters to create the best pod for your video. So all hooks either have a combination of these four things, or they have one of these four things or all four of them. So P is pain or problem. So that's the pain that the person is currently feeling in their current state. The O is objection. If you know your audience, you know what they're already going to uh, have as an objection for you. The D is destination. This is either the positive outcome that they want or the negative outcome that they want to avoid. And then S is solution. The thing that you can give them to get them to the destination or away from the destination and avoid a problem or objection. So let me contextualize this. Remember, they're modular. You can pick two together, one together, three together, all four together, whatever. The shorter, the better. So try to keep it within seven to nine words when you're saying something or your title. So one of my highest performing videos is one psychology hack that will attract anyone to you. That was the title. So if we think about it modularly, one psychology hack, that's the S, mm -hmm. to attract anyone to you is the destination. Mm -hmm. It's a solution destination framework. Mm -hmm. That's how I stitch them together. Key thing here is you don't want to give the answer the way. So whatever is the core part of your video. So in that video, I give them the solution. So the solution is the core part. You want to suggest it instead of being explicit. Notice how one psychology hack, I never told you what it is yet, but you do know where you're going to go. So that's the title. The hook, I believe, was like, here's an easy scientific tool that you can use to speak to anyone, 
even if you're shy and introverted. I remember this video. So scientific tool, that's the S, to speak to anyone, that's the destination you want. The O is even if you're shy or introverted. Mm -hmm. So it's an S D O. Mm -hmm. So just to make this super simple, what are you going to talk about? Try to say the hook with one of those. So for example, bringing it back full circle, if you've been here for two hours, you know that I kept saying, I used caloric deficit as an example. Clearly my dad bot is flaring up and I want to lose some pounds. So that's why I'm saying that. But if I want to tell somebody, I'm not going to say caloric deficit is the best way to lose weight. Notice how I didn't suggest anything. I was very explicit about the solution. And now they can just go Google caloric deficit. Yeah. Not a good hook. Nope. Versus easy tool to get you into the bikini you've been eyeing for a year. Yep. Easy tool, solution, destination, get you in the bikini you want. Maybe that's the headline. Then the title is, here's an easy tool for you to fit into that bikini you've been dreaming of without having to work two hours a day, seven days a week. Yep. Solution, destination, objection. So just think about those things and then say them as a hook or headline. And that framework has never been taught publicly. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And shout out to you for holding the space. You know, I I love it. And and I think too, and, and I'll give one final lesson to wrap the show is even when I think about hooks, I think one of the things that people have to understand is like there are hundreds of billions of dollars. So many. Invested in marketing. So many. Investing in research. And when you start to play this game, you'll start to realize (laughs) that if you're willing to look one level deeper, then you can see things in frameworks. All the time. And I think it's important as you share these things with people, like there's a reason like, and I only know this because Men's Health was a client, but there's three words on the cover of every single Women's Health magazine. Do you know what they are? Sam, I'm sure they're... I don't know them off heart, but like I'm every, sure I could every pick cover them. and the amount of money, and I'm talking in the eight figures that they spent to figure this out. Secrets, yeah, breakthroughs, yeah, transformations. There you go. And do you want to know what's funny? They're so powerful that I can make a hook and a headline that has no context, and people will pick up the magazine. Yep. The three secrets to create breakthrough results in your life and get the transformation of your dreams. That's it. What's the desired future state? So like I say that as like a funny example. So you're surrounded by this. So like, you know, when I used to get stuck before tools like ChatGPT existed though, like I would just go to, um, and this is, was my little hack. I'd go to top converting sales headlines of 1920, top converting, uh, newspaper headlines of the 1900s, uh, best Gary Ogilvy headlines. And you know, back then you would see, you know, the blank, the blank, the blank. But if you looked underneath it, it was, Avatar, yep. Before state, yep. Paint. <laughs> Think of any infomercial. A thousand percent. Infomercials so, do this to the without integrity. And so, <laughs> for for sure. So the reason I say this is like I want everybody listening to really write down what Mo said because those are the four, right? And it's it's the art and the practices. He's like one of my favorite websites is this YouTube channel called Creator Hooks, mm. and once a week he sends out the best converting hooks and titles and the worst ones from YouTube with a nice. breakdown of why psychologically oh, scores them and they're they're genius but you know when you start to get this you look at it and you're like oh i have a hundred hooks because i have the object desire framework i have the p the d i have the o the s yep. and what you'll find is you'll start to find the ones that resonate with the flavor congruently with your audience and your language too that That's matches why I like, your language it's it's you can write it however you want to but usually it's one of those four in some sort of combination and then you, followed by the three a's you're either helping someone achieve a reward yep. avoid a pain or activate a hormone which i call dopamine or adrenaline you either want to make them stressed you may not even be providing information nope like the news is perfect at this they just want to fucking activate a hormone oh, and they usually want to stress you the yeah. hell out yeah for sure or dopamine to make you feel good so like, yeah if you can tie the hook back into that that framework has made a lot of clients a lot of money for sure <laughs> for sure yeah and and we'll even tie those three a's to the five buckets on the next podcast because i even have more to your three <laughs> and ways to like add levels to let's this game do it. so let's do it we'll see we'll see where that road leads us but i'm gonna i'm gonna end this one so we don't open up another two hours of this episode so um What's your Instagram one more time? Spell it. Mo Isma. It's basically my name, Mo Ismail, but without the L. So M as in Mary, O I S as in Sam, M A I. That's why it always confuses me because it's missing the L. It's missing the L. It's Mo Ismail, but without an L. 
Mo is male without an L. So, so Mo, Mo is ma. Mo is ma- male. May. May. <laughs> Mo, yeah. You're the communications major. How do you say that? Mo is ma. M O dash I Z ma. Mo is ma. Oh, that's the phonetic pronunciation. Is that the right word, phonetic? Yeah. Yes. Mo is ma. I don't know how to spell phonetic, but I think it's a PH. I think it's PH like fat, PH like cool. Yeah, but then is it fo? Yeah, it's O and oh. then E. Nedic. Yeah, Nedic. I got it. You fuck yeah, fuck. It's like food. It's like P H U K U C K. Yeah, it's like you have a PhD and I'm using Thai food to remember how to spell a word. Hey, analogies will always work. They always, always will. Work. Oh, I just remember like four open loops from the show. I want to talk about <laughs> the next one. They hit me so in that good. moment when you talked about that, and then I remembered T's Gap and Zygarnik. And then hooks yeah. and yeah, so well, yeah. All right, we'll do another one. That's we'll that's the game. Thanks for holding the space, bro. Oh, dude, Probably this was this here. was a gift. So for everybody listening, obviously Mo is a dear friend. Um, this episode probably comes out after the event, so you missed it, suckers. If you didn't see him speak, sorry. <laughs> I heard it was great. It hasn't happened yet, but I know Mo, so it'll be great. I heard it was great. Um, but we'll be partying there. So if you're at the event and you caught this after, well, maybe you'll sign up for the waiting list for the next one. Uh, so you can come experience some of my matrix at the customer journey. That's a fact. Uh, mine is George.com slash event for all of that if this is your first episode i am sorry and a welcome to the matrix welcome uh, but this is the best introduction with one of my best friends and so i would recommend that maybe you go pick up another episode or two to make sure that this slice of crazy is the slice of crazy that you want to hit subscribe to that's a fact because once you take this red pill you do not go back to the woman in the red dress Double red, double red. So take the red, don't take the red dress. It's the red pill, not the red dress over Facts. in this neck of the woods. So this has been an absolute fucking blast. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you, brother. Uh, if you ever want to get a doppelganger and feel famous, find Mo in the wild. He can perform <laughs> as Drake. And I've seen it happen That's at so midnight funny. on the curb in Santa Monica with a whole lot of drunk Canadians. That's a fact. And it will go down as a core memory. Shout out, Mike. Shout out Mike <laughs> from Calgary, bro. From Calgary. And they let us know. They let us know. Whew, and that was a funny one. So, so catch Mo in the wild. He appreciates being stalked in the wild. <laughs> He's semi-famous. Instagram gave him a blue check mark and he is gaslighting. I mean, moonlighting as Drake. <laughs> Give me that check mark. Yeah. Once, I, once I'm <laughs> a formal Drake impersonator. That's what we want. So that's what we got. So this has been fun. Uh, Hit up Mo, slide into his DMs, let him know thank you, share a takeaway. If you have any questions for him for the next episode, send them into my DMs and I will save them. <clears throat> Probably so I forget to ask them and we have another rabbit hole conversation Love that will it. lead to part three. So have a beautiful day. Remember that relationships will always beat algorithms, especially the one with yourself. So I will either see you in the next episode or you will hear me in your earballs. But either way, we out.